driving home. I'm going to get in my car. We're driving down the main street. It takes us about a quarter of a mile to get to our actual block. But before that happens, I just got to tell you guys, you know, you're driving, you have to pay attention to the roads. And I'm looking on uh, my passenger side and there's this big parking lot, you know, with a few shops. One main shop was empty. So it was further back. Very well lit. And my kid, he goes, Mommy, mommy, look at that, look at that. It looks like a big dog walking. And I didn't think anything of it, guys. I promise you, I did not think anything of it. I'm thinking it's late. I had to wake him up, get him dressed, to get him in the truck so that we can come on home. Now, here's the thing. I get one block before my street, and I actually see it. And I'm thinking it's somebody just, you know, playing games. So I turn on my block. And on my particular block, it's like um, there are businesses on the first part of the block, and then there are the residential homes. So in between the businesses and the residential homes, it's like a little, I can't say it's like an alley because it wasn't an alley. It was like a little thoroughway where you can drive through from one area to the next, like in between the two main streets, Miller and James Street. It was an area that you could drive through that separated the commercial buildings from the residential buildings. Now, as I turn, right there where you could drive through, where it's almost like an alley, there's a light, a light. And, and you know, I'm not driving fast. I'm driving slow. I'm doing maybe like 10 because I, I, like I said, I saw it, but I didn't see it. And I knew it was coming in my direction, the way it, it moved so fast. I mean, it, it's so fast. It's nothing like what these animals can run. It, it moved so fast because as you're driving, you have to keep up with traffic, right? So if an animal is running, a moving vehicle is going to go faster. This thing was right there as you stop. And it goes from like a little driveway, then it's the street, then it's my truck, and then it's there. This thing ran right in front of my truck. Now, I'm going to explain something to you. A Ford Explorer is 67 inches, or at least my 2000 Ford Explorer was 67.7 inches from the wheel to the top of the vehicle. This animal was maybe like three feet in front of me. And when I say it was tall, it was taller than my little bitty two-door Ford Explorer Sport. The fur was so beautiful. When I say it was shiny, it had a shiny coat. It was beautiful. The arms, the arms were so long it came past its kneecaps. The, 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 the chest, the chest was, it was so wide. It looked like an oversized bodybuilder. That waistline was very, very small. But when it got to like the butt part and, and, and all of that, you could tell. It was an animal, but the upper part was more human and the fur was, oh my God, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. The head put you in the mind of a chihuahua, but it was all black. And when I say it was ugly, it was ugly, but it was beautiful. The eyes, the eyes, oh my God, yellow, red, red, yellow, it, it, it just frightened me because I never saw anything like it. The arms were long. The, the, the fingers were, it's almost like it stopped right there because he wanted me to see it. But the arms, just think of a, a monster with long, exaggerated fingers and the nails were black. Everything that I saw was black except for the eyes and maybe a tooth. And that was picture perfect white. And I saw all of this 
in the dead of night. This thing was huge. It was huge. And it, it, it just, it, it, it was like it stopped in front of my truck, like to say, I'm here and I'm watching you and I know where you are. Baby, it scared the stew out of me. And my kid was like, mama, what is that? What is it? And I have no words for him. I had no words because I did not know what it was. And the moment that we got a good look at it, that's the moment it moved. And it happened so fast. It was almost like a split second. And when I say it ran, it ran very, very fast. And when I looked to the right, it was almost like it went down the backside of my apartment complex. And honestly, I didn't go home. I turned back around because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't. I didn't. I did not know what to expect, y'all. I didn't know what to expect. I did not know what to expect. And the smell, I had my moon roof open just slightly. The smell from the sting. That's where I could place the smell that my kid and his friend stepped in to that creature there. It's not a pleasant smell, but the creature itself, the, the muscular, the, the, the way the muscles were built, it let me know that it's not from this, not from any animal kingdom here that we are aware of. Just the height the way it moved, the, 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 I don't even think a, a, a bodybuilder could take this thing on. And I'm going to take it a step further to say it had to have been, it had to have been about seven to eight feet. I know it was taller than my truck. And I know I had to put my face up to the windshield to look up to see its ears. That's how I knew it looked like or similar to that of a chihuahua because I really could not see its face because I was so focused on the chest part, the arms, the fur. The fur is what got me because it was black and it was beautiful and it was so shiny under that midnight light with the street light. That's what it was. I couldn't get the name of the word, the street light reflecting off of it. And it just, it kind of, it scared me guys. It scared my kid. It, it, it's, it's no words for it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I can talk about it without actually crying because I've never seen anything like it. I don't know what else to say. It, if you ever come across one, you're going to smell it first. You're going to smell it. It's like a skunk, poop, uh, urine. Look, I'm a nurse. I'm going to say it had a fecal odor, a urine odor, an odor that's out of this world mixed with a skunk maybe a little sweat or something, because it was warm. It was warm. Maybe 80, 85 degrees with a slight little breeze. And when that breeze with my moon was being open, it was no way I could mistake this for what my kid had stepped in and what his buddies had stepped in. It came from that creature there, that one there. And, and to To be so close to the city of Detroit, I'm going to tell you guys, I was very ignorant because I thought this only happened in the country or on the countryside. I never thought these creatures would come to a major metropolitan area. But if we're tearing down where they live, where else are they going to go? How else are they going to survive? They got to live just like we do. And we got it. We must be coexisting because if, if this thing, if I saw this thing in 2000, I saw it in 2021 
and I smelled it just yesterday, February 3rd, 2022. They are living here amongst us and they must be doing it peacefully unless we intrude upon them and their territory. Because if it's like a dog, it's got to be territorial. It's got to claim its space. And if we don't know what their space or their territory is, how are we to know? Maybe where I lived in Oak Park was its territory. Maybe where I parked my truck in the back of my apartment to my back door, maybe that was its territory. And even in my bathroom in Oak Park, I don't say that thing was outside of my bathroom window. And where I live now, guys, I am on a fifth floor with a balcony. I refuse to go on my balcony. I refuse. And I'm a person that's kind of outdoorsy. I like to go on my balcony. I don't care if we have the snow like we have it now, which is a couple of inches. I know this thing can crawl. I know it can scale a building. I won't open up my blinds to my balcony because I'm afraid. Because what I saw December 31st, 2021, I was in my bed asleep because I didn't work that night. But I felt something at my bedroom window. And it was not actually at my bedroom window. It was standing on the cement let me see if I can describe this. My apartment complex has a cement wall that separates it from another building. I'm looking at that wall now. That wall has to be about a good six feet. The dog man was standing on that cement divider. When I got up out of my bed, something said, look out the window. I looked out my bedroom window. There it was. Guys, this is 21 years later. December 31st, 2021. Now, mind you, my first encounter was August, I believe, 2000. We're 21 years later. Why would I wake up from a very wonderful, sound, sleep, somber? And just go to my window and look out and there it is. Then I go to my extra bedroom and I look out the window. It looked like it followed me to this window that I'm in now. Then I went to my living room where my balcony is and it followed me there. And it did not move from its position. The head moved because I saw it move. Then I came back to the second bedroom. It was still there. Went back to my bedroom. It was gone. Oh, boy. You're doing fine. Take your time. There's no rush. <coughs> I'll tell you what, Lily. Let's take another break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Again, please remember, take your time. There's no rush here. Whenever you're ready, Lily, please continue. I did speak to my son about our 2000 experience. And he's now 29. But I believe he still has the concept that he had in his mind when he was a little boy. He says he remembers a tall figure and he shut down. He won't, he won't mention it again. He won't talk about it. He, he just, he'll say, Ma, I don't want to talk about that. That was a dark time and I don't want to talk about it. And he'll get, he just won't talk. He won't talk. So I think this did something. To his psyche, as far as animals go, you know, he was a kid that at one point in time, he wanted a dog. He doesn't want one now. 
him trying to get him to change his views on that. That was just something that he happened to have saw. And he knows that it's, I would like for him to expand his mindset on thinking that there are other beings along the lines of animals that have not been cataloged by our scientists as of yet. And if they have been, it hasn't been publicized. So I want him to expand his mind on that, but I don't know how that's going to work. I really don't know because he won't talk about it. He thinks I talk too much about it, but we have to let people know that these creatures are real. They exist. They have some form of intelligence to let you know that they're around and they'll do things to let you know that they are around and that they do exist. Listening to your podcast, I'm so grateful I came upon it. I find that I'm not the only one. And with my few experiences that I've had thus far, I see I'm not the only one that he'll come back to just for whatever reason. Um, And I got to say this too, guys. As an African-American woman, I never thought I would have this experience. But I did. And we need to come up and start speaking out and letting everybody know that they are real. We do see them. And I just want to share my experience. I mean, forgive me for my tears, but it is frightening. And um, to see something that you normally don't see on a daily basis, unless you're watching something like a, a werewolf movie or something like that, it's unreal to you. Or to me, it was. It no longer is unreal because I know what I saw. I just got to get over my fear of crying when I talk about it because that that look, it's just too much for what I, I, I guess I have to include myself in that the way that my son thinks because I've never seen anything like it, not even the werewolf movies or the creatures, they really can't compare to a dog man. They come close, but not what I saw, not what I saw, not what I saw. Dog man, as far as it looks, the closest that we will probably get to see them, if you've never laid your eyes on them, is maybe a werewolf. But for me, that doesn't even compare. Because it's more to what a dog man is versus what a man created from his view of what he thinks or whatever the, the, the werewolf is. That, that creation and I guess what I saw, they're similar but not, not quite the same. They're, they're not. They're not. They're not. I don't I don't even know what else to say, guys. They they are real. They exist. They are here. And they'll probably play with you, I guess, like this one is doing me. And this kind of play I don't like. It's it's kind of scary. But with what I'm sharing. I kind of feel like a load is being lifted off of my shoulders. And I, I, I just know Dog Man is real, guys. He's real. He's out here amongst us. Vic, I don't know what else to say. I thought I would be able to have more to say. July 
1990. If you know anything about Peru, Indiana, we are the circus city capital of the world. Ringling Brothers houses here during the wintertime. Uh, in July, it's we have what's called Circus City Days, where they pretty much shut down six to eight blocks of uptown. They set up rides and Ferris wheels and, you know, the games, the food courts, things of that nature. And I was 16 at the time, and probably there was a good 15 of us that all hung out. Uh, we were good friends in school, out of school. There were supposed to be 10 of us. We'd talked about going camping after being uptown during the Circus City event. It was going to be a two-day thing. Me and the first five were going to set up camp, find a good spot that was close to town, if not in town, which the spot we came to was close to town. That's how we wound up where we were. It was maybe six blocks away from pretty much where everybody lived. The spot, let me try to describe it. If you start to head outside of town, we got what's called the Wabash River that winds through here. And there's a tree line that comes off of a set of railroad tracks that runs directly beside the river. Where we were was down by the west end of town. There's a bridge there. It was an old power plant, an alleyway just off of those tracks on the left side. And on the other side of that, there was maybe 15 homes there. It runs off of Canal Street. And on the other side is maybe about a 60, 70 yard stretch of woods that runs down parallel to the Wabash River, down the berm. You got to go down the hill, maybe 25 feet or so off of the train tracks. And then the wood line starts. And then there's a trail, a main trail that runs through that section of woods. That is where we decided to set up camp at. It's in the woods, you're by the water, but yet you're still in town. So it's a five minute walk, literally to anywhere any of us needed to go. But yet you're still out of sight. You know, we were teenagers. That's how we wound up there. Anyways, we were all uptown having a good time. We decided to leave a little early. It was starting to get dark. It was maybe seven. So the five of us, me and four other friends, decided to go set our camp up so we left and got to the spot pitched our tents had a nice fire going pretty much talking about what we were doing that evening what we were going to do the following evening going back uptown i would say by this time it was somewhere between 9 30 10 o'clock it's dark we're all sitting around the fire pretty much facing the same way down the other side of this trail with the river off to our right. And I had noticed before the sighting ever even actually occurred, a smell, a really strange smell. I've heard people describe it kind of like a wet dog. This was something like that, but not exactly. If you have dogs or you've been around dogs in cold weather, they get a really funny smell. When they come in from outside after being really cold, I don't know if you've ever smelled it, but it's a funky smell. I started noticing that smell kind of mixed in with maybe garbage or carrion, but that was the pervasive smell. And I had noticed it for several minutes. So it had to have been there, I guess, watching us for several minutes. I did not see it at first. My buddy's sister, who was actually one of our buddies, she was one of the guys, had gasped. And when she gasped, I looked to where she was sitting and her hands were steepled over her nose, just below her eyes, like in shock. So I follow her line of sight, which was almost directly in front of where I happened to be sitting. On the other side of the fire, at first, I didn't see what she was looking at. What I saw looked maybe like a tree that's been struck by lightning. It's dead. You can tell it's been there for a long time, standing up six, seven feet tall, you know. 
And I thought that's what I was looking at until it moved. And I realized that it isn't a tree. I couldn't focus on exactly what it was at first. And then I realized it was a torso, a huge torso, not overly large. I've heard some people say they look like bodybuilders. It wasn't exactly like that. If you've ever seen the movie The Howling, they got the head part wrong, but the body was almost spot on for what I was looking at. You couldn't really tell if it was hair or fur. I could tell that it was an extremely deep gray that faded into patches of black. And then I seen the head mounted on these shoulders and around the eyes was black, kind of like on a German shepherd, how they got the black around the eyes and then it fades out to a brown, but it wasn't brown. It was a, a lighter gray and ears that stood straight up on the top, like a German shepherd's ears, but they didn't look like they belonged on that head because the muzzle didn't look like a German shepherd. It more resembled a pit bull is kind of what it looked like. The muzzle wasn't short, but it wasn't overly long. I didn't see any teeth at first, but the eyes, they weren't exactly yellow. They weren't exactly gold. It was something in between. And they really stood out because the darkness around the eyes. I just sat there staring because I don't think my brain was registering what I was looking at. Then it, I can't say if it took a step, it had to have, but I couldn't see the legs from where it was standing. There's sawgrass that runs through the woods, probably about four feet tall in between the trees, you know, and that's what it was standing in next to the tree. So I couldn't see from like the knees down other than a, a hand. It wasn't a paw like you would expect to see on a dog. It wasn't a hand like a person's hand. If you've seen raccoons up close and you know what their hands look like, long, you can see where the bones joined together. They were just really long and very narrow like a raccoon's hands. They came to a point where they were much darker, like black. But they didn't look like nails. It looked like just an extension of the finger. But they came down to a point, if you understand what I mean. When it came forward, that is when I started to see the teeth. It opened its mouth just very slightly. And if I didn't know better, I would say it was actually tasting the air is what it looked like to me. And I sat there just taking this in. It was probably seven feet tall. The size alone is it just never mind the fact that you're looking at a creature that doesn't exist. How can something this large be basically in town like this in the woods or not? My mind just clearly wasn't working right after taking this in because I never looked around at anybody else to see what they were doing. I had no, I no idea what they were doing. It was just like the only thing that existed in, at that very instant was me and it, me looking at it, it looking at me. I don't know how long I would have sat there because I, I think I was in shock. I really feel like I was in shock. Once my mind registered, this is a werewolf, because I had never heard the term dog man, but I had heard the term werewolf. And so that is what sprang to mind. And by the time that thought sprang to mind, I could hear pounding and it was getting fainter and fainter. That's when it occurred to me. They ran. That's when I looked around. They were gone. They bolted and just left me sitting there. Once that thought registered, I'm sitting here in the woods with this thing. I don't know if I blacked out. 
or if it was just sheer terror clouding my reason. But the next thing I recall from a clear memory point is running up that gravel path to get back to the top of that embankment, to the tracks, to the alley, and then over to Canal Street. But I do not remember getting to my feet. I do not remember turning to run because I don't think I would have put my back to that thing. But once I hit my feet and I was running, I never looked back. I ran all the way to my house. I never slowed down. I now know where the term your heart in your throat comes from because it literally felt like it was going to come out of my mouth. I got home, panicked. My mom was there. I woke her up. I didn't tell her what was the problem. She went back to bed. She knew something was wrong. And I have no idea where the other four went. One of my buddies that was there did show back up that night, probably a little after midnight at my house, knocking on the window. We discussed what we saw. But after that night, we never talked about it again. The others that were with us refused to talk about it at all. In fact, they outright denied that they saw anything. I don't know if that was their coping mechanism, because maybe if we talk about it, then that makes it real. That means this happened. And so they never spoke another word about it. In fact, we never hung out again after that. Now, my friend that did come over that night after it happened, we did stay friends for a little while, but even we quit hanging around each other. And it was because of this one horrifying event. I don't know. You can call it a werewolf. You can call it a dog man. You can call it a lichen. I don't know what to call it other than a nightmare. And that instant, it turned my world upside down because you realize that there are things in the dark, even though you've been told as a child there's not. There is. I've had horrible nightmares for years. I did go through several years of counseling to try to fix it. I actually went through about a three-year spurt where I drank very heavily, just trying to forget about it. And you can't. You just can't. But that was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I never want to see something like that ever again. I think that may not have been my first encounter, but it was the one that I was the closest to. I had an incident when I was about 13, TPing. If you guys know what TPing is, you go out with your friends and throw toilet paper in people's trees. Well, that's what we were doing. We snuck out and was toilet paper in people's trees. I'm not proud of that now, but that's what we were doing. And after being out for about 45 minutes, that smell, I smelled that smell for the first time in somebody's backyard because they had a big, beautiful weeping willow that we were just about to load up in toilet paper. And the smell was accompanied by a growl that there's no way came from a regular dog. It was the sort of growl that you feel in your bones. So it was either really close or it was very large, but it was standing beside right up next to this house. And there was no lights in this backyard. So it's pretty much pitch black except for the light of the moon. And I never got a good look at it. All I saw was a very large shadow and that smell, which at that age terrified me. So again, we ran home and I don't know if it correlates with the sighting I described or if it was something else. I honestly can't say, Vic, but maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe once you have an encounter, you're going to have more. I hope not. I really hope not. But the more I'm listening to your show, the more I'm realizing that there is a connection there. And uh, that was the first one.
The one camping was the second one. That was the main one. That's the one that almost unhinged me. A year after that, I was with my current wife. We were just dating at that time. And there's a place called Peoria Fishing Pier. It's right above the Salamone Reservation. And there's walking trails down through there. And we had spent half the afternoon down there having a picnic, walking the trails. And it was getting on later in the evening. Didn't see anything that time either, but the smell was there as we were walking back to our car. It's now dark. The day was over. We were ready to leave in the growl. We both heard it. We looked at each other and we literally fled for our lives. Looking back at it, picturing that growl, there's nothing I don't think that could have made that sound other than what I saw on the Wabash River that night, 1990. And I love the outdoors. I love to fish. I love to hike. I love to camp, but not around here anymore. Not unless it's somewhere where there's a lot of other people. I never go unarmed. And uh, I don't camp on the Wabash no more. I'm not quite sure what else to say other than it has affected me to the point that there's just things I don't do that I used to do. I moved to Florida for 22 years, as I said at the beginning. Now I realize it was misguided. But the biggest reason I went down there, not just for work, but an irrational thought that if I can get as far away from here as I can, I'll never see something like that again. That was my reasoning. I realize now that that was foolish, but that's what I thought. I packed everything up and left. I figure if I'm in a big city like Tampa, no woods, no nothing like that, that I'll never see something like that again. But after listening to the show, I realized that they're everywhere. And so it doesn't much matter where you go. I also realized that had it wanted to get me, it would have got me. This thing was six, seven feet on the other side of that fire ring. I was five feet on the other side maybe 15 feet away. That's how close it was. As close as the thing was, he could have got me at any time he wanted to. He could have got all five of us had he wanted to. He was close enough. I'm going to guesstimate 15 feet, maybe even a little closer. But the way that it just, the word I would use is ghosted. It just ghosted into the firelight. One second it wasn't there. There was nothing there. And the next second, it was there and never made a sound, but it could have. It was close enough that when it first appeared, as I sat there in shock looking at it, I could literally see its eyes scan right to left looking at us sitting there. That's how close it was. And with the size of it, the way this thing was built, it's clearly an apex predator that was clearly clearly intelligence in those eyes and honestly i think that's as horrifying vic is actually seeing the thing in person is knowing that there's intelligence behind something like that's eyes how do you rectify that in your own mind uh, how do you come to terms with the fact that these things are out there you're told your whole life things like that don't exist you're told your whole life that there's no proverbial monster under the bed. And when it hits you in the face, like it did me, that shatters that what you thought was reality. Because you understand immediately that none of that's true. And there's no way you can go back to your normal life and look at things the same way again. You just can't. And that's kind of what I've dealt with this July it'll be 32 years and until I found you in your site there's nobody that I've really said that to me I can count on one hand the people in my life that I've actually confided this to and although they say they believe you you have to wonder in the back of your own mind do they because if somebody was to tell me this story prior to this happening to me I know what I would have thought you were drinking or you were doing drugs or something. And then you see it 
with your own eyes. And then what do you do? Because I don't know. I didn't know. What do you really say to somebody after that? If somebody was to tell you that story and you weren't you and you didn't do this, what would you think? What would you say? How do you tell somebody that? Picture it, uh, October day, 1980, 80, 81. I was probably 12, 13 years old. Fall, sunny day, in the 50s. I lived on 55th and Silver Spring in Milwaukee. And across the street from my house, there is uh, the 24th Armored Division of the Army Reserve. Back then, it was not fenced in before 9-11. So it was pretty open to the public. We used to ride around in the parking lot with our go-karts and our mini bikes and stuff like that. And we were always back there screwing around doing stuff. And then behind the Army Reserve, they had their fenced-in lots with their tanks and their Jeeps and stuff like that. And there was a creek that ran through the woods from the city. It ran all the way through there, and there was railroad tracks that came in. There was two sets of tracks. CN uh, runs their trains on them. Back in the 40s, when World War II, it used to be a prison camp for, uh, I'm not sure if it was German or Japanese prisoners. They turned it into a Nike missile site, I guess, in the Cold War. They had an uh, underground missile site, so there must have been many uh, levels of the site. There was wooded areas. There was areas where there were ponds. The one side of Haven Woods, there really wasn't that many woods on that side. It was pretty open. And there a lot of trails, and it was hilly, and but pretty flat overall. Till the wood side, on the left side of the creek, which would have been the northwest side of the creek, there was a section of woods that went along the creek um, that went under a trestle going further north. So on, on this day, um, I go over to my friend Keith's house. I walk over there because my bicycle broke down. I was big into BMX bikes and we rode on tracks and stuff so i went over to my friend keith's house and uh, i was him and his brother craig but when i got over to his house he said that his brother craig was out in the woods there was a bmx track out in the woods that somebody built i was never there before at this bmx track so i had no idea there was even a bmx track out there because we used to ride our bikes on another course by a, a 51st and villain so I go over there, and he tells me his brother's out there and with his, all the other guys. So we decided to walk out to the woods. You had to walk across the parking lot of the Army Reserve, and you follow the creek line. There was a dirt walkway that you could pass alongside the creek that everybody walked on it, which we were out there all the time. So we walked on, on the creek, and, and on this, there was a – tree that was across the creek and granted this creek is pretty small it's probably only eight feet wide um not even probably a foot deep my buddy wanted to cross the tree to go to the other side because that's where we had to go i said no i had some nice shoes on and clothes i didn't want to take a chance of getting all wet and so i said let's go down to the bridge and we'll cross there so we kept walking we walked down to the bridge got down there Went across the bridge, so we were on the east side of the creek. As we're walking out the trail, and it was a bigger trail. It was almost like a car trail. It was wider, you know, 8 to 10 feet. And then we got to the woods, and then it turned into a smaller trail, like 3 foot wide, just for a walking path through the woods. And granted, here it's a sunny day, 50 degrees. It was probably October. A lot of leaves were on the ground. There wasn't that many leaves on the ground at this time. So me and my friend are walking out to the woods on the trail, and we heard the, my friends up in front of us on the track. And as we get up to the track, nobody was there. So we thought, well, they must have went out the north end of the area. There's a bunch of ways you can get out of the woods to wherever they went. Um, so we decided, well, we're going to walk back. So we're walking out of the woods back towards where we were coming from. And on the right of us, you could hear something walking with us. And granted, we're on a dirt trail. 
Okay, there's not many leaves and stuff on a dirt trail. I was walking on a dirt trail, you could hear something crunching the leaves and sticks walking with us. And it felt like they were right there, like 10, 15 feet from us. All you could see was woods. You know, you've seen just the trees. These trees, there's big trees, small trees, very densely populated uh, wood area. There's nothing out there. And I yelled, I was like, who's out here? And there's dead silence. So we kept walking. And now on the left side of us, you could hear something walking with us. And we were on a trail. You could hear it in the woods crunching like it's right there with you. It was like there was no other sounds you could hear except for the crunching of something next to you. But you can't see nothing. It's just woods. Now, like, my hair is starting to go up the back of my neck. I yell, who's out here? Who's who's screwing around with us? No answer. Okay. So we kept walking. We're still trying to get out of the woods. And now in front of us, you could hear something walking. It's not like we could see footsteps or nothing like that. But you could hear something walking with us. And there's nothing there. Now I'm scared. Now I'm really starting to freak out. And we stop, and you can hear still walking. You're like, all right, who's out there? Who's screwing around? And there's no answer. So we turned around, and we walked back towards the, to the track again. You know, now, okay, now this thing's whatever is out here is freaking us out. So we turn around, and we're starting to walk back towards the track. Now, in front of us, you can hear the exact same thing. You can hear and sense and feel there's something there crunching walking with you you stop walking and you still hear crunching a couple steps and there's nothing there so we're walking back down the trail and now it's in front of us again like it's on the trail walking with us and it feels like it's five ten feet from you you stop walking and you can still hear it walking take a couple steps and it stopped and there's nothing there. It's just the trail and the woods and the wind blowing. And it's like, okay, who's out here? You know, who's screwing with us? And now I'm really frightened. Now, now I'm like, oh my God, you know, there's something out here that's tracking us or something, you know? And I looked through my friend. I said, hey, the railroad tracks are to the left of us. Let's just go to the railroad tracks and get out of here because the tracks led up to McGovern Park. So I just turned around. And right there in front of me, within 10 feet next to a tree, was a monster, a creature. It was a giant. Its body was big, black. It was built. It was probably 7 to 10 feet tall. I locked into its face. It was, like, right there in front of me. And I just, like, went from its body up to its head. And I locked into its eyes. I froze like the thing paralyzed me. I couldn't move. I yelled, but nothing came out. It was like a silent yell where I was so frightened and I turned ghost white looking at this thing. And this thing is standing there snarling at me like it wants to kill me, like it wants to, like it wants to eat me, you know, and I couldn't move. I was frozen and it felt like I was sitting there looking into its eyes. My mom told me that it was a mask, but this thing was real. This thing, you could see its face, its teeth. It was moving. I mean, this thing was growling, had its mouth open and monster, big wolf teeth and pointy ears and black and deep black eyes. It had black eyes. It, it didn't have like red eyes or yellow eyes. Like I see any people talking about dog men. This thing looked like a wolf on steroids. This thing was huge, upright, standing upright, had arms like they were built. Its body was built. It had a huge chest dog-like, but it was standing upright. And I didn't know what it was. It was a monster. I never seen anything like it in my life. And like it, all of a sudden, it wanted to be seen. It like, tracked us every direction we walked. It walked with us, but it was like invisible which I could never explain that. And then all of a sudden, it, it just appeared right there. So I froze. 
I was paralyzed. I, I screamed. Nothing came out. I, I finally got my composure, and I, I took off running. I was gone. I ran out of the woods. I didn't, my friend was with me. I didn't even look back. I just left him. I was thought I was going to die. I feared for my life. I didn't look and talk to the dang thing to see if it was intelligent. So picture that I was a little chubby guy. I was probably four foot something at the time. My friend was probably almost six foot. He was two years younger than me. Skinny guy could outrun me any day. And I just left him. I left him. I ran out of the woods. I knew the closest place that I could get possible help was there was a dead end street of 55th. I lived on 55th. But it didn't go through because the creek went through there. The road didn't go through. And it started back up on a dead-end street that maybe went on a quarter mile with some businesses on. So I know this, knew the businesses were over there. So I ran towards there. I ran out of the woods, through a field. I never looked back. I was running for my life. And I remember running up to the building, crossing the street. I got to the street. I ran up to the building and there was a glass windows and glass doors on this building. And I ran up to it and I tried to get in the door and it was locked. And so I'm sitting there hammering on the glass door with my fist. Like, let me in, let me in. There's a, I seen this wolf, this huge thing. I don't know, you know, and I could see the reflection behind me. Like all of a sudden I see my friend come running up. I don't know if this thing was chasing us. And I turned around and I said, Keith, did you see that thing? And he said, no. He goes, all I seen was you. He said, you turned and you just turned ghost white. He said, your jaw dropped and you just froze. And he said, he froze looking at me. And he said, all of a sudden, boom. He said, I was gone. Honestly, I left him like he probably didn't come running up to me until eight to ten seconds after I was already at that business, which is unbelievable because the guy was could outrun me any day. So I was like, hey, you I swear I seen that like a werewolf or something, dude. He goes, I don't know. He goes, I heard everything, but I said, let's just get out of here. Let's go. I said, I gotta get to safety. I am going home. So I ran down 55th Street. And now granted, the crick comes into this the more of the city part out of the reserve. Now it's like a concrete waterway. So I ran down the concrete embankment. And at this time, I ran through the creek. I didn't care. I was. I had to get home. I was looking for safety. So I ran through the creek right across the street. There where I ran through the creek was a uh, flower shop. And I remember running along that fence line. And I got to Silver Spring, which Silver Spring was a four-lane uh, road. So it was a busy street. And I was praying to God that there was no cars coming when I'm running because I'm running home. I ran across the street home. I got home to my house. My mom was home. I told my mom. She told me I seen a dog or somebody was screwing with me. She didn't believe me. And then, like, later on, my dad came home. And I, I was terrified. I told my dad what happened. And my dad, he's like, oh, yeah, he, he took everything nonchalance. He said, oh, probably somebody was screwing with you. My mom was really the one that says, oh, no, there's nothing like that. There was a dog you seen. And I told her no. And then my brothers came home and they all gave me a hard time. Oh, Mr. C, you werewolf. And over the years, I was scared, frightened for a couple of years after that. Um, I was young. I, I had nightmares and everything else. And I, I still said, I swear I seen, I thought it was a werewolf, but obviously it was a dog, man. And I just scares the living crap out of me. After seeing this thing, I didn't go out in the woods for at least two years, maybe three, before I went back out there. I went out to that area where I seen that dog man. And the weird thing is, I could never find the place that where I seen it. I could never find that place again. Everything looked different. I can't explain it, but where I was on that trail, it was next to a big tree. And we went back years later. And there were smaller trees in there. There were there was no big trees. And I could never find that place where I seen that creature ever again. So I did go out in those woods with my friends and we because we hung out there and I was a teenager and there was parties out there and stuff like that. 
So I was out there a lot of times, never seen anything again, but I never went back into that wooded side where I encountered that creature. So later in life, I tell all my friends, all my friends know the story. And my best friend, he always told me, he knows it's true because the story never changed. I never changed. And so everybody I know close to me believes me. Everybody knows there's something out there that we don't know about. I've kind of blocked it out of my mind. I haven't thought about it for years. Later in life, in 1996, I told my wife, I just got married. I told her the story. I'm watching on TV, uh, Channel 12 News. There were people out hunting werewolves. They seen them out in the woods. I'm like, oh, my God, there's no way. And they had the sheriffs who were out there, and they were talking about the brave the Beast of Bray, Bray Road, which I never heard about. And I never heard of anything cryptic. I didn't know what I seen. So I thought it was possibly a werewolf what I seen. Well, they were talking about they were hunting these werewolves that were been seen. So they were having hunting parties go out there. And the police weren't letting the people go out there because they couldn't have guns out there and it wasn't hunting season, stuff like that. So right away, I called my wife at work and I'm like, babes, I said, you wouldn't believe what's on TV. People are hunting these werewolves out in, uh, I think it was Burlington, Wisconsin. She's like, no way. And I'm like, yeah. So I go on to the internet and I email the news agency and told them my story and never heard anything back. So it was kind of disappointing that I never heard anything back. Then one day I was watching Ripley's, believe it or not, it was a werewolf story on there. And they said that Wisconsin was the number one werewolf sightings in the world. I'm like, no way. So again, I call my wife. I'm like, babes, you wouldn't believe this. It was on Ripley's, believe it or not. You know, I'm like, wow. I said, you know, maybe that thing I seen, maybe it was a werewolf, you know? So I don't know, 10 years back, there was this, uh, city worker driving over by Holy Hill, Wisconsin, just south of Hartford. This gentleman is picking up dead deer on the side of the road and he picks it up and he throws them back of his truck. It's dark out. And I guess he hops in his truck and he's doing the paperwork. And all of a sudden he feels his truck shake. And he's like, well, what was that? And he looks in the rear view mirror and he sees this creature he described it as a wolf-like bear man. They called it the bear man. He said he looks in the mirror and, and it grabs the deer off the truck and throws it over its shoulder and jumps into the woods. It's like gone. And he's like freaked out. And he takes off, drives down the road, and I guess he came back and he calls his dispatcher and reports it. Well, all of a sudden it's on the news. And the guy did one interview. And I guess he got about a lot of bad publicity. People were saying, oh, you're crazy. And he would never say anything again. He would never have another interview. So right away, I called my wife. I'm like, well, babes, I was like, somebody else, you know, werewolf was on the news again. I said, they call it a bear wolf. This woman, they were talking about this woman, Godfrey, that wrote a book about it. So right away, I'm like, you know, I'm going to email this woman and give her my story. And this is true. You know, I'm going to tell her, hey, I seen one in Havenwoods in the city of Milwaukee. So I emailed her and never heard anything back from her again, ever. So, I mean, I pretty much tell people that I know about it, but I'm not frightened anymore. I stay out of the woods. I, I mean, like I said, I seen this thing during the day. It wasn't even nighttime where I couldn't figure out what I seen. Ever since then, I would never screw around with supernatural, like Ouija boards or play stupid games like Bloody Mary or or ghosts or just anything i hey i seen something that's not human-like or even animal-like that we were taught what it is and i seen something out of this world uh, up until lately with social media so it's a couple months ago my wife sent me a a link to groups of these cryptids and which i never heard about and they're talking about bigfoot and skinwalkers and dogmen and so okay and there's other people that really seen this thing too you know i'm not crazy there's obviously people coming out of the woodwork and saying hey telling their stories about what they've seen so i feel 
better that I talk about it, but I hope I never see one again. You know, like I said, if I see it now, I, I'd probably have a heart attack and fall over and die before I could even run. Cause it's the scariest thing I ever seen in my life. It's like, I lived a, I lived a horror movie. Like I said, I hope I never see one again. It was, I believe, November 16th or 17th. We were up north. My brother was uh, running a hay farm for his fiance at the time's parents. After our dad passed away, 2012, I just spent a lot of time up there with them and you know, worked the hay fields. So one day we were just out riding around, doing what brothers do, I guess, in the middle of nowhere. We met up with some Amish. We were kind of in the area and my brother had struck up a deal with them where they would get hay from us. And in return, we would be able to hunt their chunk of the forest. Whatever we took out of there, we'd give them like a quarter of, you know, whatever it was at the time, whether we were small game, pheasant, whatever, deer. We went scoping around and man, it looked beautiful. There's pine trees up north where I live. It's, it's pretty much between pine and oak. That's, that's pretty much the chunk of forest we were in. So it was just beautiful, clear. If anybody's ever walked through a forest where there's mostly pine, say, in the chunk that you're in, and them needles fall and they line the floor, and it's just that copper color as far as you can see. You got some oak leaves. Beautiful. It's, it's amazing. We call it Pure Michigan. <laughs> that's our state slogan. So that's what it is. We weren't really baiting. We're not allowed to really bait anymore or anything that's really worth hauling out. So we'd always just go back and put like salt licks, stuff like that out. So the night of our hunt, rifle season just started on the, I think it was the 15th. We were down a, the gravel road, first of all, that took us to the trail to get back into the forest. We were probably 10 miles down that gravel road. And then it was a right onto a dirt road, dirt track, about 15 miles back. Halfway through, it turned into a two track. We get back there, beautiful day, not too cold, not too windy. Could hear all the wildlife going. It just felt good. It just felt like it was going to be a good hunt. So we parted our ways at the car, and we were hunting probably about three miles off of the track where we part is where we had our stands. My brother was, he couldn't have been no less than 400 yards from me, behind me. So it was about halfway through. We walked back, and we were sitting, and we had the walkie-talkies, and probably around six o'clock getting towards prime time in the area. And all of a sudden I started hearing what sounded like a, a thousand deer herd, but in reality, there's probably about 15, 20 deer. And I mean, I heard them, they were, they were hauling. I didn't even start seeing them maybe a minute. Time kind of slows down when that happens. So it was probably more like 30, 40 seconds. But I started seeing the deer run past me and I contemplated, I had my rifle up and I contemplated, probably squeeze one off, but I just sat there and just waited and everything just kind of went quiet. I had seen out of the corner of my eye what looked like a wolf. The background, though, it just stood out. I mean, I go back to that copper floor the copper forest floor from the pine needles and the oak leaves and the dead ferns, stuff like that. And it had its, uh, I'll call them airplane ears. The ears were pinned back. Like it was up to something that was on the trail, but it was just kept running through my head. There's a wolf in front of me. I'm actually staring at a wolf in lower Michigan. I was like froze. I wanted to get a picture of it, but I also just wanted to keep staring. After, a few seconds, though, it 
It started like putting its head in the air, sniffing around, ears came up. It looked like it knew I was there. It was kind of, you know, what what is this that I'm smelling? It kind of like took a couple steps and then that's when it just like stood up. And when I say stood up, I mean, I'm not talking like it stood straight up. It had perfect posture. I'll say, you know, Vic, it's not as hunched over as uh, your logo, but it definitely didn't have a straight up posture. And when I kind of gathered myself and I looked, it was like the scariest, most amazing thing I've ever seen. I froze. I It knew I was there, first of all. It could smell. It knew I was there, and it just had to find me. Now, where I was hunting, I was about 15, 20 feet up. I had like a little perfect little window where I could just see just right around me. So I kind of just like sunk back into my tree and it just kind of like walked slowly, almost like it knew now where I was and it just had to just look. It kind of got in front of me a little bit off to the right. That's when it just like stood all the way up. But when it stood all the way up, its head tilted. And I knew right then I was screwed. That's when I knew I was screwed. It looked right at me. Knew I was there. Looked dead at me. The only thing I could think to do was shaking so bad was I let a round go. That's going to go one of two ways. Either it's going to run away or I'm going to really piss it off and it's coming for me. But I had to do something. I squeezed a round off and I was using a 300 short mag or 300 mag. So it's a loud gun, a very loud gun. Anybody that hunts with a rifle knows that's that's a loud gun and it looked right at me it just right straight in my face it walked around the tree almost like uh, how how do i easily get there is what i felt um but then again there was also maybe it didn't see me i had my face painted and maybe it just didn't see me but it knew i was there Something like that. I had a lot of things running through my head at the time. It got to like behind me, almost to the left, like my back left quarter. At that point, I thought I was done. Like it was coming up behind me. It was going to get up in my tree. So I, I ejected that shell and I just boom, 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 boom. Fired what I had left in my magazine. My brother texted me after the first shot. I didn't really text anything back. He asked if I got one. I said no. And then I said, did you see anything? And he said no. Like, all right, well, I'm going to be heading down soon. I said, no, stay there. Just stay in your tree. Let's sit for a little bit longer. You can't shoot after dark. Anybody knows that. So there was really no point and was staying there because at this point it was you know pretty dark i mean not extremely dark but i told him let's just stay for a little bit we maybe sat for probably i don't know maybe 20 more minutes and this is after i had emptied what i had left we met back up and he asked me what i was doing i didn't see us did you did you get anything it's no well would you do miss no i don't miss so he said, uh, you know, what the heck are you doing? I don't know, man. I thought my gun was jammed or something. I, I was just messing around. He was a little upset with that. Messing up our hunting spot, blah, blah, blah. So we got back to the car. We were talking and, you know, we, I just asked him, did you see that wolf? He's like, no, there's no wolves down here. You might have seen a big coyote. No, definitely not a coyote. Definitely not. I left it at that. Like, whatever. He didn't see it. We got undressed. We took our camo off, whatever, and started heading back. We were 
maybe 60, 70 yards from where we were parked. We started seeing like a glow. It was off in the thick to the right. I was like, man, that is a peculiar spot for somebody to, you know, be camped out and have a little fire going. But we just kind of laughed a little bit. And then we started getting closer. And it was, I want to say a person, but they had like a, you know, black head to toe, almost like a black robe, a black leather robe. They were holding a fire in a coffee can. Anybody knows a coffee can, you're not going to hold a fire in for <laughs> any more than 15 seconds. So like that's, that's some pretty thin metal. It gets pretty darn hot quick. And we just hightailed it out of there. We're not, no. Nope. We're not even going to mess with that. We want none of that, whatever that is. And after the night ended and we're back at the house, I was sitting in the living room and it's a, you know, your typical Midwest farmhouse, you know, sitting on, I think it was 40, 50 acres maybe, but surrounded by hay fields. We had a pretty close neighbor. They weren't super close, but you could see their house. Sitting, you know, just in the back area of the house in the back living area watching TV. And all I kept thinking about was what I seen. I kept trying to rationalize it. Maybe it was a bear. No, it's not a bear. It was too thin to be a bear. And it was more defined. How can I explain it? The fur was thick, but still very well defined. I mean, it matched the contour of the body. I've never seen a dark gray bear before. That's another thing that kept popping in my head. There's no gray bears. What could it have been? I had to deal with it at that point. I had to deal with the fact that I just seen something that my whole life I was told is only a movie. That's only Hollywood. No, it's not only Hollywood. These stories have to originate from somewhere for Hollywood to get the ideas that they've had for however long they've been in existence making movies. Old English accounts of things, these thoughts had to come from somewhere. To just try and brush something off like that. And the eyes, first of all, were almost human. I don't want to say they were human, but by saying that, I mean, what I mean is you could see the intelligence. You knew what I'm looking at. That is a smart animal. That is a smart creature. I'm sorry, not an animal. I don't want to say it's an animal because who are we to classify something like that, that science still hasn't grasped around. The ears were not like directly on the top of the head. The head is round, obviously. So like right at that rounding point is where the ears started. Honestly, I'd say they would really resemble like a Doberman's ears, but more furry, obviously. And it was like a tuft of hair, like a lynx almost, has or a bobcat, has that little bit of hair that sticks up off the tip of the ears. The face, though. That is what really sent me into that shock, oh crap moment, because it wasn't normal. It was almost like, I'm not going to say skin, because there's you couldn't see skin. It was just extremely short hair that covered the face up to like the bottom of the eyes, and then down the snout or the muzzle. And when it did like the, you know, when a dog does the smell thing, like smelling up in the air, the lips kind of move up a little bit. That was the scariest thing. I don't want to say I didn't like sense aggression, but I knew at that point I was at the bottom of the food chain. I was not the top predator in that chunk of woods at that time. I feel like it, it made that known to me. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe I, maybe it didn't see me, but Vic, it looked right dead through that little window in the trees. 
it looked right at me and I had to deal with it. Like it knew I was there. Now what happens? Do I not ever go back to that spot again? I've never been back there since. That was in 2012. I've not been back to that spot since. When it like looked up at me and was like smelling and I was just kind of like staring at it. I, the fear that just like ran through me almost like you could see the muscle definition. Okay. If that thing wanted to jump and grab me, I felt like it very well could have very much. So two leaps tree me simple as that like i said it made me know that i was not the top predator but i also got that like feeling like all right maybe maybe it's just you know gonna go maybe i'll just be all right and ultimately yeah that's what happened but how did it trigger those feelings in is what I still to this day can't get my head around. The level of intelligence that I felt through that experience from that creature was insurmountable. The hands on it, I say hands, they're definitely not. Anybody who's had an experience knows they're not human hands, but they're not paws. You could see the nails and just the fur coming off the back going up the arms forearms were a little bare still had you know short fur but not as long as the rest of the body the way it stood though man was it still triggers a little something inside me like the way it stood up is like it was unnatural it was definitely unnatural the way it stood up you know at first maybe it was a big wolf that evolved and no this again is me trying to rationalize it after the fact but no that's not going to happen they're not going to stand up and walk when they don't have to the way it looked though when it stood up and started walking like that will forever be ingrained in my head the way the fur moved with the muscles and you could see the definition each flex of the muscle with each step it didn't seem like there was any fat on this thing at all there was like no jiggle when it was walking up like there was no jiggle in the belly when it stood up and everything just kind of tightened up that was probably the most fearful thing i've i still can't get it out of my head that gets me every time anytime i try and talk about it i said i don't ever really talk about it now but that's the part that always gets me and so when it looked at me i didn't really notice any shine in the eyes any predator that's how they see it but then again i wasn't trying to shine a flashlight down in its eyes or anything like that it didn't have a tail that was unnatural. Like, where's the tail? Canines have tails. Whether you chop it off at the end, there's always a nub. There was it was straight, straight back. Kind of see the spine a little bit, the outline of it. it was just the fur stood up a little bit higher in that area. So the next day, it was the next day or maybe two days later, we went to the back of the house we had a food plot back there it was 35 40 yards maybe we just had like some alfalfa and stuff like that some winter wheat growing back there we would hunt we had a little shack up on a stand about 10 feet up i wanted to sit there i didn't want to leave the property after you know the night before i did not want to leave the property i told ryan i'll sit there when the sun started going down is the coyotes they started singing and i mean at first it was beautiful you know anybody that heard pack of coyotes going it might be annoying for a second but it's actually it's pretty amazing you know knowing that they're communicating and it's no different than you and I talking right now. 
But when they got quiet instantly, I thought to myself, no way. Because they got quiet and everything else was quiet. Well, everything else was quiet first because they were going. But once they shut right up and you could just feel, and I thought to myself, no way. This is not, because it was still so fresh. So that's what I instantly went to. I'm like, there's, there's no way this can be happening. Again. No way at all. It's impossible. What I've seen, freak occurrence, there could be no way that that's going to be over here. I'm okay. Plus, I'm like 30, 40 miles away from where we were hunting. I started fixing my eyes on the wood line and see something walking. Like, all right, that's just tree branches and stuff like that. I, I know what that is. Okay, I'm not too worried about that. Maybe they just got spooked by something. <laughs> this thing is stepped out of the wood line onto the food plot. Vic, I froze again. How could this be happening? There's more. How big is the pack? Because if there's, there's one and now there's two in this close, this one was a little different. It was a little darker. The way it looked, though, exactly the same. Extremely short gray fur up on the snout, muzzle, up under the eyes. Same muscle definition. The fur was actually a little bit shorter than the first one, and it was a little darker. I froze again. What? How is this really happening again? Well, it kind of looked in my area, knew the stand was there, but I'm not dumb now. I ducked out of the window. I seen one. Now I see two. I don't need to keep staring at it. I'm all the way good at this point. So I slowly move from in front of the window, behind the little screen. Ultimately, I had my back and my head leaning up against the side wall. And I kind of heard what sounded like it was running. It started running a little bit. Hopefully it's just running out. It's done gone whatever and when i put my head back in front of the window i seen it i don't want to say walking but it was like a fast fast paced trot still on two legs for about it almost looked like it, it was picking up speed i guess to say just to make it you know simple and then you know it got down four legs started running and it was running in the same direction that we would go to get back to that hunting spot. Now, like I said, 30, 40 miles away in the country, it's easy for creatures, critters to travel undetected. But the next morning after we went back and I didn't even, I didn't even bring this one up. I had already got his reaction from the night before. We walked back to the food plot. We head back. We had a gut pile back there. And we had a bunch of squirrels and a couple of rabbits, but it was mostly, it was mostly our fish, our fish guts and fish carcasses that we'd put back there. And it was scattered. It was tore right apart. The wild thing about it though was there were tracks around where it was tore apart, where it was picked through. But there was none directly, if you would walk up and be standing over something and your tracks are going to be right there next to it. It was like, I don't know, maybe two feet, three feet behind or around. So the arm length out of the tracks and here, but you can clearly tell that something's been digging in this pot. And the strange thing is it was... I don't, I don't mean to gross any of the listeners out, but fish heads, squirrel, rabbit, was a lot of the heads and the organs were gone. No gut sack, no bone. That was all, all left there. It was organs, heads. And it just looked like it was being picked up, like somebody's just gorging on ribs. And just tossing the bones down, eating, tossing bones down, eating, toss bones down, digging through, making a mess. And it was very scary to say the least. And at that point, my brother had to accept 
the fact that there was something unnatural going on. There's something unnatural here. And we looked at the tracks. I pointed it out, put my hand next to it, bigger than my hand. The hind track, I'm assuming it was. It didn't look like what you think at this point this creature would would look like. The track was still very much a extremely large canine track. And when I say extremely large, I'm I'm roughly five eleven. And my brother is six three. His hand and it was still had maybe a quarter to a half inch around his hand. That's big. That's that's pretty big. So we, you know, talked about it a little bit and just left it at that, went back to the house and he actually ended up moving. He went to the Navy and he ended up not going back there. He stayed in Bay City. He didn't go back there. He came back to the city, ultimately moved farther down south now where he's not so secluded, I guess you would say. It's definitely stuck with me. I it gives me nightmares. I don't I don't like going in the woods, but I still do. Just for the simple fact is if it wanted me, it could have had me. I'm not gonna change my lifestyle around a fear that something I seen hundred and twenty miles away is now gonna be here. When I go hunting now I'm only 10 miles total from my actual house. When my fiance and I go fishing, we usually go to a lot of areas where there's a lot of people. I mean, we do go trout fishing a lot, steelhead fishing. There's still areas that are populated by trout fishermen and other fishermen. That's part of my fear now. I never want to experience something like that ever again. For the first time by myself, I went out hunting last year. So 2021, and this happened in 2012. 2021 was the first year I went back out by myself. I hunted the evening, first night. (laughs) I hightailed it out of there before the sun was even close to going down. The second night, though, Second night I went out, I told my fiance, look, I'm just going to go out. She knows all about this, but I don't like talking to her about it because she don't believe me. She scoffs at the idea, almost like my brother and anybody else I've talked to about it. So I went out and 10 miles total from home, but I was sitting in my blind at like 3.30 in the morning, well before the sun came up. And I just kind of wanted to try and just push myself through it. And it was very, very frightening. It was a very frightening experience. Yeah, it was hard. It was real hard. I did end up getting a deer, though, that morning. So that was a plus. But I, I still, after, I had, I didn't go back to that spot. And this was during archery season. I didn't go back for rifle because left the guts in the field, obviously. Well, what are the chances of that second account happening a a day later? Not down for risking anything like that anymore. Like, I'm all the way okay on that. This year, I'll find a new spot close to home, not too close. Definitely not anywhere near the spot I was at last year. That's how it's physically changed my life. It physically altered my pattern. It's a hard thing to cope with. Now, where I work, it's a house with an adjacent farm field. You know, I work third shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I'm a smoker, so when I step outside in the back, coyotes are going crazy. Just triggers something in me, I guess. Take a few hits off my cigarette, and I'm, I'm done. I want to go back in. Motion sensor light will go on outside. I freak out a little bit. And I've never had an experience at a house, so it's easy to brush that off. It's just the fact it's almost the same setting. Like I step outside in the back, and it, I'm seeing the same thing, minus a barn 
in a corral. It's definitely changed the way I think, the way I move, my sleeping. Definitely the most important thing that it's messed up for me, which is unfortunate, but I'm trying to get through it as best as I can. It's happened some years ago that I'd just gone through a, a long divorce process. And when it actually come to the end, I was living at my parents while it was all happening. And me and my intentions were that when it's when it's actually finished, then I'm going to start up and move on. And I thought about what I wanted to do. And the more trauma that I was going through with it, I just wanted to be isolated. So I eventually found the perfect location on the outskirts of my hometown. It was a rural farm. It was perfect. The type of place you would never leave. And I was fortunate enough to um, get a place. And I quickly decided, now it's time to move on and start my life up again. I'd had nearly two years of the worst experiences, lost everything. It was time for me to move on. So I eventually moved into this farm. I was working in a neighbouring town. I, I worked long hours. I would finish around 10pm. But the problem was getting to the farm because I didn't drive. No taxis would take me down to the farm because the roads were that old. The lanes were so bumpy. No vehicles would go down. It was too damaging to the cars. So I had to walk the last mile and a half on my own, most of the time in the dark. And the lane that I had to go down, there was woods on either side of me. The first couple of weeks, nothing. It wasn't too long after that when I was finishing work and I was walking down these lanes. I had this, I had this confident feeling that I wasn't on my own during this short walk and it was making me run the last part of it. And this started to intensify the more I was thinking about it. I started hearing something. It was mimicking me side by side. I could pinpoint it. It's like 15 yards into the woods to me, right? And it would stay with me all the way. I, I thought it was a person. That's all I could think of because it sounded like they were treading carefully not to break too many branches. But it was impossible. I could hear snapping. I could hear the moving of trees and a lot of breaking. I spent a fortune and a lot of time finding this perfect place. So I wasn't letting it creep me out too much. It didn't take too, too long before I thought, I am definitely getting followed every time I come down this path. And it started to really unnerve me. So I didn't know what to do with myself. There's only me and one lady who run the farm that, and we were really out, out of the way. There was nobody nobody around. I think it was about a month in. I used to like sitting outside the farm. It's like a nature place of nature. People go with, because there's a lot of it. The farm's connected to a massive lake, migrating birds from all over, to migrating geese, swans, come hundreds of them, all different types of birds of prey. There's horses, cows, sheep, goats, you name it. It's a great therapeutic place. And I used to like to, when I finished work, I'd usually get back about 11 p.m. I'd like to sit outside. Sometimes I'd be out there to the early hours. I'd always get the creepy feelings. I mean, who wouldn't? I was on my own in, in, in pitch black quite a lot, but it was okay. This particular night, I'd finished work early. It's about 6 p.m. It was quite warm. I'd asked the, land, the, the lady of the farm if I could borrow a, a binoculars. She had a cracking set of high-powered binoculars. They were as good as night vision. Um, she uses them to spot the birds of prey because she's a big bird lover. And she she gave them me. So my idea was, because I was off for a few days, I was just going to sit in my window and relax because um, I'm, I'm big into my nature and see what I can see. You never know what's, what's going to land in the fields in front of you. Now, the lake's 100, 100 metres away, say, a massive lake. And I have a small garden in front of me and a, and a load of bushes, a few trees, and fields and fields and fields. The field in front of me is, is packed with sheep and goats. The field to my left has got horses in it. They're always there. They're all scattered about. The sheep don't like to come too close to the farm because of their farmhouse dogs. They're quite vicious. They're always attacking the sheep for some reason, and they stay clear. But this particular night, it was I was up late. It's about 12 o'clock. It was quite warm. I had my window, window open. I had the binoculars. I had the, the moon was quite light. I could see with the binoculars brilliantly. I could see the animals. 
I think it got to about one o'clock and I heard all this awful racket, noises I've not heard before. It was, um, I'd say, a distress noise from the animals in the field. All the sheep and the goats, they had gathered as close to the farm as possible. This wasn't the first time this had happened, but this particular night, I feel a bit uncomfortable. So and I had the binoculars, so I thought, I'm going to, I'm somewhat, somewhat dodgy out there. There was three horses that were sprinting around the field following each other. I thought they were playing originally, but when I think back, no, they weren't. They were spooked. The goats, the sheep, they were all clumped up. So 20 yards from my bedroom window, I have a bush line with trees, and they were on the opposite side of that. And when I say crammed in, they were like sardines in a tin, and they were squealing. And it sounded like a squeal of an SOS. That's all I can describe. And now I've got an, a feeling summit's not right. And I was scouring the bush line really slowly. And the whole bush line was was still. Nothing was moving. It was so, so silent, not from the animals, but there was no wind or there was no noises from cars. It was just, it was just perfect, apart from the distressed animals, obviously. But I seen, can you imagine, have you ever like walked through walk through a bush or a tree and you've caught a branch by accident and it's swung you've took it with you and then it swings back and it starts swinging on its own because you've pulled it back so far well this is what i could see it stood out like a sore thumb just one branch on its own swinging like somebody just ran into it so i zoomed in and that's when i seen it was the worst thing that as far as i'm concerned eyes can see I seen a grey long arm. It was a human arm. But when I say a long arm, and I mean it's long, it's like twice the size of our arms. And there was a hand with claws, and the hand was gigantic. Now, it was an animal. I knew that straight away. And so I've gone to the left, and I've seen the other. So I've seen the left arm first, and it was dark grey. I can remember it's clear as daylight. And whatever it was, it was sort of crouched, but hiding. But I could see its arm. I could see the other arm. It was exactly the same length. If I've got my arms dropped, they go by my hips. But these arms, whatever it was, were running down the side of it. And it was not far off touching the floor, if that makes any sense. They were that long. And it was hunched over. And I've started to muck about with the zoom in. I mean, I hadn't took a breath. My heart was, heart was starting to pound. And I thought, I don't know what this is, but it, it's an animal. And it stood on two legs. And I've got the chest and I've seen breasts. Now, that was the bit which got me because this was the worst sight. It looked horrible. That's all I can say. There was nothing nice about it, put it that way. Now, it's 1 a.m. So the last thing I've seen of it was when I, I actually zoomed in on its face and it was a dog's head. It was a big dog's head. Now, it looked smaller because of the position it was in, in the bushes, and it was hiding. I could clearly see it. If it didn't have binoculars, you wouldn't have seen it, but I did. And I could see it, and it was staring straight at me, dead in the eyes. I don't know the words to explain. The moment I clapped eyes on it, and it was staring straight at me, and I just had this, the only words I can describe is a blind, crippling fear just come out of nowhere and it hit me straight in the chest. The next minute I was on the floor. My heart was beating so hard. Vic, I'm not joking. I could hear the valves squelching as it tried to push blood through. It was that bad. I thought I was going to die there. And then I managed to crawl. I was on my own this night as well on the farm. I managed to crawl into the bathroom. I thought I was going to die. The noise my chest was making, I don't know what it was, but it was instant. My legs had gone. I had no strength. I actually thought my heart was going to stop. It was that bad. And it lasted for about 30 minutes where if I wasn't so fit and healthy, if I had any type of um, heart deficiency or anything up with me, or I was not looking after myself, I reckon it was enough to kill me. I was that scared. If you can imagine what an impending doom feels like, if you multiply that by 20, you will not come close to how I was feeling. It was horrific. So it's early hours now. 
the, these hours were the worst horrific because I just kept thinking, whatever that was, I'm on my own. It was looking at me like it knew me as far as I'm concerned. And it wasn't a glance. It gave me the impression it had been looking at me all night. And not just this night, a lot of nights. And the penny dropped. And I thought, oh, no, this is what's been following me. And everything started to make sense. Oh, and the emotions I was feeling was unbelievable. I, I'd called my father. he came to pick me up at daylight, 8 a.m., I was in the worst state ever. You wouldn't have recognized me. Uh, my facial features had changed. I was, it was like I just dropped pounds of weight. I was a different color, a color I hadn't seen before. I didn't think it was possible. I think my granddad had the same color when, when he had died. I was that bad. My father took me to his house. Now he lives about 30 minutes away. He moved out of Winsford with my mother when he retired. So, I didn't go into too much detail with my dad. I just said I had a few issues. And he thought I was, um, because I was, well, newly divorced and setting up, he thought I was a bit lonely. So that's why the reasons I wanted to stay with him. So I just left it at that. I had 24 hours now to stay at my dad's. And I sat there with just the worst thoughts ever of, I know what I've seen. I know what it looks like. I've got a name for it. How is that possible? This isn't real. This can't be true. Now, when I, when I think about all the danger signs that I was picking up and ignoring during my stay, and I was sat out in the garden on many a night, 20 yards away from where this thing was perched, I started to realize this thing uh, obviously had a problem with me being there. And I was trying to find answers of why that this feeling, I couldn't shake it off. Dad to stay at me, Dad's. It, it's all I could think of was, I need to answer these questions because I've got to go back there the following morning. What do I say? Does the farm lady know? And I thought, there's no way she does because she's on her own. She's the happiest person on the planet. And this was going to change me for the rest of my life. I knew it. I didn't know what to do with myself. The following morning, I come. I didn't sleep. My dad decided, uh, you know, uh, we'll have some breakfast and then he'll take me back. I didn't want to go back. But I'd only just moved in. I put a lot of effort in. I didn't want to lose it, lose the place. I didn't want to go back. I had nowhere else to go. I had work that day as well. Everything was piling on top of me. So I, I decided to go back. Um, my dad dropped me off at 9 a.m. The lady of the farm, she wasn't home. I've gone upstairs, gone back into my room. No sooner than I sat on my bed, she turns up. I could hear her pull a car up on the, on the car park. Give it 30 minutes. This is 30 minutes. She had already been back in the early hours, so I'm not sure what time. Something's happened. She's disappeared. I don't know where she'd gone. She's turned up, and um, I heard her coming up the stairs, and she's knocked on my door. And we rarely spoke. I would work a lot of hours. I'm a bit of a night owl. We rarely seen each other. And she doesn't knock on my door, but this day she did. This morning she did. I opened the door, and she looked pretty poor. She looked white as a sheet as well. So I thought, oh, my God, what's she going to say? Um, she says, can I ask you a couple of questions? She says, um, have you witnessed anything on the farm last night, any any noises out the blue? I said, I wasn't here. I didn't tell her why. I said, I've only just got back myself about an hour ago. I says, why, what's happened? She says, all the chickens, she had 14 chickens, free-range chickens that were quite happy to walk around the farm. They didn't live in a cage. They were free to walk the grounds. They were always on the grass outside my bedroom window. They were friendly as anything. All of them had been killed. Now, I wouldn't say killed was the appropriate word. I'd have said slaughtered because what I seen and what happened the night before just fitted together like the last piece of the jig puzzle because all the body parts, none of them were eaten. They were sprayed all over the garden. But the worst part about it was, which um, I didn't tell the lady was, I'd noticed that some of the body parts were smashed all over the wall under my bedroom window. Now, I had to comprehend that. It, it wasn't the first thought in my mind was the worst one. They don't look, that doesn't look like an accident. Not only is that uncommon, I've got an answer for it. And it looked like, can you imagine somebody being really angry and picked up one of these chickens and actually hit the wall with it? That's what I seen. Sprayed chicken all over the wall. And it was the most disgusting, horrible 
pill fight I've ever seen. She were everywhere. She was mortified. Um, I had a good chat with her. I didn't tell her anything about what I'd seen under the bedroom wall because I had to knock all that off. I wasn't going to tell her what, what I'd seen. I, I couldn't comprehend it myself, let alone tell the lady what, what was going on. And then I thought to myself, this is down to me. If I hadn't spotted that animal or whatever it was with the binoculars, it spotted me looking for it. And I just think if I hadn't done that, these animals would be alive. It was a clear warning, a definite threat to me, 100%. The atmosphere was still as bad as it was the night before, and this is the morning after, and I was getting all these horrible feelings. And they were to leave immediately to pack up my stuff and get out of there first thing in the morning. I was like on a time limit. That's the only feeling I was getting to go, do not stay here anymore. If I do, there's going to be a problem if you can work that out. And I took it. I took the hint and I left. I rung my dad up. I broke down. It was a bit too much for me to... I found the perfect place and, I've, and I, had, I had a great job. I thought life was going to start getting back and I was going to start building a brilliant future. And I wasn't going to move, but it's all been taken away from me in the worst way. My dad said I could go and stay with him, no problem. Um, he said it was too soon for me to move out. It wasn't. It was just what had happened. So he picked me up about 11 o'clock. I packed my stuff up. I didn't even tell the landlady I was leaving. I um, I didn't know what to say to her because I was torn between what do I do? Do I put the effort in that I need to to describe to her? She's going to think I'm a crackpot for starters. She's not going to take me seriously. And if I'm going to go down that that road, I'm going to have to say, them chickens, there's another thing which haunts me, the last thing she said to me. I says, has anything like this ever happened on your farm? She says, in the 17 years that she's lived there, she has not witnessed anything as devastating as this morning that she's turned up. That scarred me. That was the last words that um, I had with her. My heart's going now, just um, replaying. It's a different story reading it when I've wrote it down, but actually bringing it off my chest, the feelings are still well grounded in me. From that moment, Vic, I was a bit, I was lost, to be honest with you. I had these thoughts of my life will never be the same. And like I said to you before, um, we started recording, I've got a lot of loved ones. I, I come from a big family. I've got lots of friends I care about. They we're all at an age now where everyone's got children. We all love the countryside, keen campers, keen fishermen. And I am on the outskirts of Winsford, and I've just witnessed one of the worst things that a person could imagine. I mean, we've all seen the films where you see the, these creatures and you just think, you know, it's all right, you can go to bed and tomorrow's another day. This is not going to be the case for me because this was actually a real event. I wish I could have said to myself, and I tried, but there was just absolutely no point in, in trying to lie to myself. I felt embarrassed because I had such a detailed, and I I over-examined it. I didn't sort of hit the face first. I got the arm. I knew it was an animal. I got the length of the arm, which started me. I would started to think, oh, dear, what the is this? I went to the left. I got its other arm. They were long. It was the hands that creeped me out the worst. I've seen many documentaries. I've heard people explain, but people don't go into detail how frightening the sight of the hands that these creatures have. It wasn't so much the hand, it was the length of the fingers, I'd say, and the nails. It was the perfect picture of the worst horror scene, as far as I can explain. Everything you don't want in your vision. I had binoculars and they were quality and I had the perfect view. This was the moment that um, I had to make a decision because I live in around countryside and my whole life is I'm a keen camper. You put me in a rural area, I thrive, uh, but now it's all jeopardised. How am I going to comprehend going out, let alone I wasn't thinking about going out at night time again. I thought it was a nighttime thing. How wrong was I? It's a daytime thing as well, very much so. If anybody thinks that these dogmen only operate at night, believe me, they operate in the day just as much as night. Trust me.
And the reason why I'm saying that, Vic, if I can explain to you, there was an event which happened on the, like I said, things happened on the build up towards this. And this is pretty significant, but I let it go because it wasn't scary, but it was something that needed an answer. And I, I, I got one and it wasn't, it was in the first couple of weeks. It was a sunny day. I was off. I had my window open. I was listening to all the birds and I was thinking about going fishing and I was in a great mood. And I seen what I know now, I didn't know then, it looked like a ghost, like a human, but completely see-through. I could see the outline of it and it sprint straight across the garden, I, hand on heart, under my window and into the field to the right. I had the clearest view of it. Now, I know different now. I know what it was. That was a cloaked cryptid. Now, if anybody wants to know anything about a cloak cryptid, and this is the 100% identical version. So, you know, it's exactly how, if you've seen the film Predator, the alien, when it cloaks itself and moves, you can see the outline of the animal as clear as daylight if it's moving. It stands out like a sore thumb, especially if it's running at speed. It's so obvious. The moment it stands still, you won't see it. You wouldn't know if it was two foot in front of your face, but if it moves, you'll see it. That is a, the best example and version, not an inch either side. It's the perfect example was the Predator on the, on the film of Arnold Schwarzenegger where it cloaks itself and then it runs through the trees when Arnold's shooting it. That is exactly what I seen. Now, when it ran past me, I'm talking, it was 10 feet away and I was looking down on it. It was large, as I said, a tall human, six foot, seven foot possibly, very fast, thick legs. It looked like a normal body, but very tall. I thought it was a ghost, some kind of entity or, and this farm's hundreds and hundreds of years old. I'm not too spooked. I'm pretty tolerant to anything like that. I'm not easily spooked. I never have been. It'd take a lot to knock me off my perch, trust me. This didn't. And I soon forgot about it as the stay went boom. Um, and that's when everything else started to... And I remember the patterns of the animals. It's like I said, the, the, the animals wouldn't come near the farm. The two dogs that she had were vicious and they absolutely hated the sheep. The sheep hated them and there was a divide between them. And they would stay scattered over the field, nowhere near the farm. And for the animals to come so close to the farm, and if they could have, they'd have jumped the fence and got in the garden under my window. And that is fact. They'd have never done that with these dogs, but something was spooking them to cram them in such a bunch. I've Googled noises goats make. I've Googled noises sheep make. And I still can't find the identical noise that they made that night. It's weird. It was an obvious cry for help. It, can you imagine all the sheep are scattered in the field and they've got an indication that something malevolent is in the area and they let warning signs off to each other. This would have been it. It was like, we're going, we know where we're going, we're going together, let's let this noise out so everybody knows and they all were doing it. It was the most noisiest racket you've ever heard. You wouldn't have thought anything. You'd have thought exactly like me. That isn't normal. That's not the noise of um, what sheep makes. It's clearly got it for a special reason, and this was it. They were in danger. They knew it. And I also got the impression as well, don't ask me why I'm so strong with these decisions, but I wasn't mulling these questions. I had answers for them for some reason, and I'm telling you now, they knew something was out there that jeopardized their lives. You could tell a mile away. I could tell a mile away that something was out there. And I got a horrible, malevolent feeling that maybe something's out there. And I shrugged it off. It doesn't want to kill the animals for food. It just wants to kill them. That's the only feeling that I was getting. And it was strong. The air was thick with it. I used to think I was a bit paranoid or I'm getting the bit because it's a creepy area, but I love stuff like that. Well, I did do. It would be so therapeutic in the day. And as nighttime come, I would sit outside right near the bushes 
and the sheep would be scattered all over the field and they would make the noises of sheep and it was so peaceful. It was like, you know, you're I'm on a little holiday resort. But then the odd night, it wasn't like that. There was no noise. It's like they were all keeping stum. And I'm talking 80 sheep. And then this wasn't normal. And I used to think, oh, that, there's something going on. And I got a little bit excited and I thought, I'm going to have to get some binoculars. And then I found out she had the cracking pair and I asked her and my idea was I'm going to sit there and I'm going to scour these fields because I'm getting it. Everything was overwhelming me, the following that. And then I realised I am getting followed. But I never thought it was an animal or, or something as dangerous as what I witnessed because it's not possible. These things are not real. No chance. I've never in my life, up to the age of 40, ever come across a story. I never looked for it on Google, YouTube. I was never interested. I certainly wasn't bothered when I went camping in, in remote places what the history was of the area. But from the moment that this happened, I started studying on areas all over the country. The length and breadth I've been digging up history and the werewolf history in the Cheshire area goes back hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years, right back to the Romans, and it's documented. If you look for it, you'll find it, and you'll see that these stories of these dogmen and these animals, whatever types they are, and I've found out personally, and I can guarantee you there's not one type, there's a lot of types. I've seen three different types, up close, personal, from safety of being indoors, they're different types, and they're big, very big. What hit me as well is what I've, I didn't know then, but it's always of the knowledge that I've gained. These animals can drop you like a feather, no matter how much you weigh, no matter how strong you are, no matter how much of a powerful human you think you are. They only have to look at you, and whatever they do, they can put you on your back in a, like a state of paralysis and it's something that they can choose to do to you whether they do whether they don't i think it's down to the moment that you've got at that moment with them and me i think when i go back and i've put the pieces of the puzzle together i've just thought oh well, my god i could have worked this out well before if i'd put any effort in and i'm thinking i've been in the way of this creature and it's hunting patterns because I quickly realized that all the migrating geese that were landing, they were landing, they were coming from abroad and they would land all together and they would all group together. The swans would join them. And then every now and again, I would think they're killing each other. It sounds like they're literally killing each other. They're, they're attacking each other. It was gone from peaceful bird noises like you'd expect in a nature place in nature. I hear it in the day, and you can see clearly they're all swimming and they're getting on. They'll have the odd peck at each other. But at, sometimes at night, they're actually making noises. I thought they were killing each other. They were attacking each other at nighttime every now and again. But after all this had happened, I thought, no, they're not. They're getting attacked. Something's coming in from the fields to the right, which stretched all the way to a neighbouring town called Crewe. And it's so easy to get to all the surrounding woods and trails. And it's like a route in. But this lake is such a food source. So many different types of birds. Birds that like to land in water. But at nighttime, they come on the land to sleep, especially the geese. Well, at nighttime, for some reason, they're all ending up in back in the lake. And Canadian geese don't do that, really. They find a settlement on the bank. Some it's attacking them. And then I realised that's what these animals are coming in and they're going for the birds, the big birds as well. Swans were getting um, slaughtered all the time. The landlady of the farm, she had um, fishing rights for the top of the lake and I was a keen fisherman. I couldn't wait to get stuck in, but I was concentrating on work for a start to enjoy myself. But there was the problem with foreigners that were turning up and stealing fish when they caught them. But she was also blaming them for bird deaths, the swans that were getting killed. They were in a local paper. Somebody would decapitate and dewing a swan and leave the body parts spread all over the bank. It was getting blamed on these foreign fishermen. And it wasn't them. These animals were getting killed, whether it's for sport, pleasure, 
or whether another thing which I've come to know, there's surrounding areas in Winsford. I've gone and archived and documented. I even went as far as knocking at farmers, local farmers. Some of them were really obnoxious. Some of them are really welcoming to me questions, but I just wanted to know, has anybody had any livestock killed recently in the past? Or if they've only just took the farm on, did the previous owners have any problems? Because we don't have problems with wild animals. I was struggling to find anybody that could explain what I had seen. I did find them in the end, people that were describing exactly what I seen. And I was thinking that's the exact type that I seen, definitely. But I couldn't find anybody that had seen a female dogman. I've not come across many. There's a few in the UK people that have. Funnily enough, they're close to the Cheshire area. But the one I seen was 100% female. It, if you can imagine breasts that a monkey has or an orangutan, they were exactly like that. Like a, a no hairs on the chest. The arms did. And they weren't big arms, not like you hear a lot of them muscly. They were long. You wouldn't want them round your neck, put it that way. But it was the length, the sight of these arms. If I wasn't in the comfort of my bedroom on the second floor with that tiny bit of safety net, which soon got took away once I got that horrible death feeling, I don't think I'd have got past the first moment where I seen its arm. At the moment I seen its arm, the first thing that came in my mind was animal. Straight away, I didn't have to think. I knew it, whatever it was, was an animal. I quickly realised it was stood up, not on four legs. It was stood up and it was panting. But I've heard stories of people where they describe the dog men where they breathe in and they sound like they smoke a thousand cigarettes a day in there. <laughs> this wasn't. This looked like it was calm as anything, but it's got big lungs to fill, basically. I could see the movement and the chest slow, big. You could tell it was filling up a big set of lungs. That's the only impression. But I was coming apart so quickly. But I don't understand. There's another question which I've still not got answers for. Well, I have got an answer for it now, but at the time, I don't understand because all my strength went. And when I say I was, I don't drink, don't smoke. I am into me fitness. I could run until I would fall asleep before I stopped running. I, I was that fit. I eat like the best that a person could. I study health for a reason, but it meant nothing. The moment I zoomed in and caught the look on its face staring at me, it did something to me that has happened again to me 18 months later in Yorkshire in England, which is another counter which I'll, I'll tell you at some point. The same thing. It was like I'd been hit by a freight train of death feelings. And I'm not talking one feeling. I am literally going to die. It's not a thought. It's not a fear. It's beyond fear. It's actually something's affecting the way my body was. It's like a short circuit right in my heart. And the noise my heart was making. I don't think anyone that's had a heart attack would have ever heard what I heard. I've Googled heart problems to get to the bottom of what my heart had done because I, I had basically thought my life was over. Whatever I've seen is going to go back to do what it does. I'm going to die tonight. I can't move. I couldn't get help. I've got a big heart, me, and I had the back of my mind. I'm thinking, should I call the police? And I thought, I can't call the police because I've only just moved. The woman will think I am an absolute idiot. The more I thought about what I should do, my heart was pounding out my chest. The squelching noise as it struggled to push blood through it was so loud. I had tears rolling down my face. I thought I've just been killed by something looking at me. It was that real. It's no joke. I don't know what it's done to me, but it's paralyzed me. And I was on that floor from the moment that happened when I crawled into the bathroom and I had visions of it sat outside and I had the feeling that it hated me. And it had a reason to hate me as well. I only got that answer. I didn't want to think about it because it was just pushing me over the edge. I was thinking, what have I done? I've got a feeling as I'm in the state that I've done something to it. That's the only feeling that I, that I had and I couldn't get rid of it. I am being blamed for something right now. And I don't know how it was possible. It was crazy. 
it's just things you can't ever expect that you'd ever deal with. I just thought that thing outside absolutely despises me. I knew that straight away. And it wasn't um, something I'd made up. It was real. I don't know why, but the only thing I could think of was when I was always outside, I was a night owl. I spent my time outside. And I think I disrupted its feeding pattern or I kept spooking the animals or something. And I've got on its nerves to the point it's not happy. And it must have been figuring out what to do with me. And it was following me. And it was making decisions on me because it was following me every night as I walked down that lane. I could hear the delicacy of whatever it was nimbly trying to guide itself through the woods, which was pitch black. Now, it's impossible. Nobody could do that in daylight, but this thing was, and it was snapping things. And I just got the feeling that that was a big mistake. And you could feel it was happening again and more. And I thought to myself, something is in there following me every night, and I can't get a lift down here. And I had no choice. The last thing on my mind was um, it could be anything like that. But the whole process has never left me. It's definitely scarred me for life. It's like I said, if I'd have let it fester, if I'd have let it consume me, because I spent so many nights on my own, I'd already ostracised myself from everyone while I was getting over my divorce. So I had that gap where I didn't have to go straight into me life because they'd have known something was up with me and I couldn't hide it. So I had the time to reevaluate my situation and, and try and get some answers, and I did. And what got that ball rolling was when I came across your show. I wish I could remember which episode got my attention, but straight away I was hooked, and then it opened Pandora's box because I needed more. It sort of intertwined with my love for the outdoors. If I didn't have a passion for the outdoors and the countryside, it wouldn't have happened, but because I have, it didn't die. It wasn't killed. I thought it would have been. I thought my life's over as it is. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself, but the next time you see me anywhere near a field at night, there's more chance of me shaking hands with Elvis Presley tomorrow than me ever going near anything green again. And that was it. I managed after a few months, I think it was three months before I took the big pill and me and my friend went out camping for the first time and it happened again, but worse. That was it then. It was um, it was pretty much the way it was then. And it has been like that for the last five years. And I've uh, gained quite a lot of knowledge through your show. I've met so many people from all over the world and every story that I've heard, there's not one that hasn't made me sit down and just feel devastated for them. Every single person that takes it we're not all built to deal with stuff like this. And I'm telling you now, there's a lot of people that won't. And my heart goes out to them because when this is introduced to your life, it's a maker or a breaker. But the daunting thing is if people do experience this on the level that I did, and there's a lot worse, and I'm thinking anything less, it all still meets in the same department. What do you do from that moment? Because your brain starts to work. Well, does this happen? Did he go there? I can't go there. But then you start thinking about your loved ones. I've got to warn them, especially when you hear your family getting ready for a picnic. They're all getting excited. They're all up for it. They want to do something different. They want to go deeper into the woods or they want to go to another place that they've not been. And I'm thinking, you can't. You can't do that. You cannot get your, yourself ready for a picnic, drive halfway across the country to a place that you see as beautiful through whatever history it has, because I'm thinking, now I know what's out there, I'm thinking these are the places where you go for a picnic and you don't come back. And these stories, sorry, Vic, I've, I've got too much coming into me um, into my mind now. And this is why I only wanted to do a little bit with you because there's so much to cover. The rural areas around my hometown we are absolutely scattered with history. And there's always stories. Where my dad lives, it's a place called Tatton Hall in Chester. It's still County Cheshire, but it's connected to rivers, canals, waterways. Every forest and woods has a connection to each other. 
it's easy for these things to get about. It's like me knowing I could walk around my hometown with my eyes closed. It's easy for them to do it as well. And you can see, once you look at it on Google Earth, you know how these things can get about. You know what fields they would go across. You would take them if you were avoiding the public. And they're the places you need to swerve, like the plague, because they are out there. And another thing as well is what I gathered, the local woods. We have a, a wood which um, I had uh, another encounter at. We've only been there twice ever since. Um, I was hearing all sorts of stories about people seeing these big dogs coming down the train track into the forest off the train track, which I quickly realised then that these things, the hunting forests, the hunting woods, but they live on the outskirts of these areas where food lives. They don't live where the food is. They live away from it. So if the forest is full of the animals that it would have, they like to keep them there because if they populated it, these dogmen, they're only going to spook the animals into moving to another. So they like to keep them in. And this is the sort of patterns that I started. And after speaking to a lot of farmers, now I don't know one dog that could get off the lead, which is always being blamed in the local papers. I'm forever gathering evidence of sheep have died. None of them have been attacked. No predator has touched them. There's no teeth marks. The first thing you'd think of, which goes with the normal grain of things, is it something to do with UFOs? But what I found after that, when I've spoke to farmers and they've been good enough to trust me, I've not gone and told them me, me reasons why. I've just picked up this information and I'm curious. And some of them have told me some of their sheep are getting killed in big numbers, but they're all dying of heart attacks. They're not being bitten. They're not being torn apart like some of the animals that do get ripped apart. Then the cows are having their underbellies ripped and everything's being put down to dangerous dogs. Not dangerous dogs that have been caught and then put down. They're not around, but the finger's waving at a dangerous dog. I know different. I know it's definitely down to a canine. It ain't no domestic dog and it isn't no dangerous dog. It is a full-on predator that lingers out there that's doing this. And the hallmarks are everywhere, especially the sheep that I find. There's places all over. My friend said he lives in a place called Macclesfield. It's about an hour away from where I live. It's the countryside connected to a moors. This moors has a history of attacks and oh, dating back to, you'd lose count if you went back to how many years. But all these animals that were getting killed in, in certain areas, the, the sheep are dying from full-on heart attack. They've been run ragged by something to the point of where they've died and then they've been left. Now, I did a lot of homework and I spoke to a lot of people and listened to a lot of things as well. And people have seen these big, massive dogs chasing sheep to the point where it looks like they're playing with them. But I found out quickly that dogmen, some of them, I can't remember exactly now who put this on me, but when they rear it, they're bringing up young. They like to send them out to practice killing, basically. This is why some people don't understand. You know, there's a lot of livestock, but people are saying there's dogmen about these livestock don't get touched. Yeah, well, it's optional. You want to just dig a little deeper and you'll soon find probably closer than you think that animals in other areas are getting slaughtered, killed, practiced on. The younger dogmen have heard people numerous times in groups saying that they've seen them running sheep ragged. They could have quite easily caught up with them and ripped them apart, but they haven't. They've chased them to the point the sheep drops of exhaustion and they leave them like a training tactic sort of thing to teach them to hunt. Very clever. Now, how true that is, I've not personally seen but the stories, it all makes perfect sense. But then you get the stories where a lot of sheep have been ripped apart and not eaten, but killed, like the chickens. If you talk about a dog, man, any type of dog, man, they are designed. I'm intrigued. It is a full-time hobby of mine, a passion. Now, this cryptid subject is very much part of my life and will be to my last days. That's fact. I wouldn't replace it with anything. I don't give up. If I get something in me in my mind or a place I want to visit, I'll always go. I will go there and I will dig up something and I will come back with some type of info from the past 
off the person that's witnessed something or that I've made. A lot of people contact me on my Facebook that I've got quite friendly with who have had similar encounters, not really in your face, but they know something is wrong and I've sort of pushed them in the right direction and told them to get into Dogman Encounters. That's where they'll, the growth of the knowledge comes from. The more episodes you listen to, everything seems to come into one pot eventually and you know different types of dogmen, the patterns, the way they operate, the way they can leave you, the way people have been so close to them and not been killed. But I have started an interest in what about people that are killed that these governments, they know the amount of people in this country that disappear every year is in hundreds and hundreds of thousands. These people are missing without trace. They're not found. They're not returned. They're gone. Never an answer to where they've ended up. How many of these people meet their end to these cryptids? This is something we'll never find out because if the government starts letting us know what's in our countrysides, this country will come to a grinding halt. And that is fact. Length and breadth of the country would not be able to operate. The government would then quickly have to answer for how many years of past devastation that they've covered on many levels, how many deaths have they been aware of that are down to these creatures that they've ignored, telling the public they must have accumulated over how many years have gone on. They're never going to let, let us know. And the more this subject gets out, the more we uncover we're never going to crack that, that bit we need because it's always going to get shut down by the government and we're sort of facing an uphill battle no matter how hard we try. It's a dangerous game to play as well for anyone that gets really the bee in the bonnet. I know America has a lot of hunters. We don't have that over here. Um, we just have keen campers and people that are interested in the outdoors. And there's a lot of people that are interested in the cryptid world. I've got there's a handful of people who have had experiences in your face, especially on my level, which I've had. I seem to be one of a, a group of people. Yeah, I think there's a lot more to the story. There's so many people that need to come forward with the stories, and these areas need documenting for everyone's safety, really, because it's okay in the daytime when these parks and tourist attractions, these outdoor areas that are open to the public, at night time, they're a different place, no matter what. And the thing is, if the governments were to come out and let us know exactly what they keep from us, they would have to shut these places down for our safety. It just it grates on me um, how they can just let us wander around. My encounter happened in early September of 2005. I was 23 years old at the time, working as a waitress in a restaurant bar attached to a golf course. Normally, my shift ended around 9 p.m. The golfers would come in, they'd have their dinner, they'd talk to their friends, and then they'd go home. But this evening, the golf course had happened to be hosting a banquet. So we ended up having to stay a few hours late. Normally, I would have been driving from around 9 p.m., but at this point, it's probably 11 o'clock or so when I left the restaurant. It was a beautiful night. You know, there was no clouds. The stars were bright out in the middle of Michigan. That's something that I miss to this day because even here, you know, we don't live in the city, but there's so much light pollution. So I would oftentimes, even, you know, if I was ever driving, when it was full dark outside, I would take my time. I'd roll my window down and I would, you know, look at the stars as I drove, kind of go a little slower than I needed to, listen to music. I had a three-year-old daughter at the time, so I think I used it for a little me time maybe. This particular day, I'm driving home and you can see for a good long while, the majority of the area that I would drive through, I would call them back roads. I wouldn't say they were way out in the country, but, you know, it was fields. Michigan's very flat, or at least the middle of Michigan is where I'm from. Very flat. So you can see the one lone house, you know, way out in the middle. And then you drive and there's more fields. And it was a lovely evening. 
as I'm approaching the road that I live on and I'm getting ready to make the turn, uh, I notice that the trailer home that was, oh, I don't know, a few hundred yards maybe from the corner, they had a yard light out at the end of their driveway and they had a fair amount of garbage there. Looked like maybe they'd done some spring cleaning or something. I mean, it was larger than your normal amount. I see what I believe is a bear. And I'm actually really excited. In Michigan, it's almost a sport, wildlife spotting. You know, everybody tells everybody, oh, I saw an eagle. Oh, I saw a wolf. And I had heard people say that there were bear in the area. But I myself had never seen one. So I got like immediately excited. You know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my at the time husband that I saw a bear. I turn and I kind of pull up slowly because I'm hoping not to spook him. I'm hoping that he'll stay there long enough for me to get, you know, at least a look and confirm what I'm seeing. But as I'm approaching what I believe to be a bear, I start to realize that it just doesn't look right. I pull up next to it. I put my car in park and I'm looking out my passenger window and I can see the fur and the fur is far too short to be a bear. I don't know a whole lot about bear, but this is fur that's like what a horse has or a Doberman. It's very short. And I can tell that whatever it is, is very, very muscular. I can see its muscles, you know, moving as it's digging in this trash. But I also realized that what I think is the long side of a bear makes no sense. The muscles aren't moving correctly. There's a strange kind of hump where the back should be, you know? And I'm like, what am I looking at? And I'm expecting it to click. I'm not at all afraid, which is kind of funny, you know? I've heard a lot of people who mention having this kind of dread feeling before they even know the dog man is anywhere around. I had nothing like that. I was completely clueless. I pulled up and I'm watching it and I'm realizing the shapes are just all wrong. And I'm thinking any second it's going to click, any second it's going to click. I can't even figure out, you know, what end of it I'm looking at because it just makes no sense. I know that whatever it is, is hugely muscular. Like the muscles are so pronounced. It's almost like what you see on a bodybuilder, you know, how the skin is quite thin on them and you can generally you know see every well-defined muscle it was very similar to that and i'm thinking what animal is built like this and then he looked at me and i realized that what i thought was the broad side of a bear was actually his shoulders face on and he had his head down doing whatever it was that he was doing with the garbage i wasn't looking at the broad side of a bear at all he looked at me and i froze Still, there's this little voice in the back of my head going, okay, it's going to click. What is it? It's going to click. You're going to figure out what it is. But I mean, he was massively muscular. His shoulders were the width of a black bear. I've never seen anything so muscular. And I'm not an expert on black bear. I mean, obviously, this could be not the most accurate of comparisons, but that's what I assumed I was approaching. I didn't get a sense that he had much of a neck. It was almost kind of like his shoulders just kind of humped and rolled up into his head. The fur was very dark, very short, covered the entire body. I didn't see much variation in length. He had the strangest eyes. His eyes glowed of their own light, which I've never seen anything like it in my life. Afterwards, I kept thinking to myself, it's got to be eye shine. It had to have been eye shine, but the yard light was directly above his head, and my headlights were well ahead of where he was because I had pulled up even, and they, you know, they were pointing down the road, so I couldn't figure out what could have been causing any eye shine. Plus, it was like they had a light that was as intense as like an electric burner when it's fully heated up. They glowed with this reddish sort of amber color. He had a muzzle, but it was a very short muzzle, more like a hyena or, you know, one of those shorter nosed dogs than a wolf or, you know, a German shepherd. I oftentimes hear people say German shepherd, like he looked nothing like a German shepherd. 
The mouth was the most horrible part. I had a hard time taking in the rest of him because of this mouth. The mouth looked kind of like an anglerfish's mouth. You know how they they have those teeth that kind of interlock and the teeth are visible even when the mouth is closed. That's how his were, but he didn't have, you know, the very thin kind of needle-like teeth that they have. He had very thick, large teeth. And I swear, and this is the part that I've never heard anyone else say, and it always makes me think that maybe I am a crazy person. They almost looked metal. These teeth shone so brightly that it was almost like a metal type reflection. That's why I kept staring, thinking it's an animal, a can or something in his mouth, and it's going to click for me and I'm going to realize what it is. But they were his teeth. I assume they weren't metal and they just happened to shine strangely for whatever reason. I mean, his eyes glowed, so it's not so far-fetched to think, well, his teeth are strange too. But I'm just staring at him and he's staring at me and we've locked eyes. I'm just sitting there doing nothing. And he starts to stand and I realize that he stands bipedally, that he stands like a man. And he's slowly standing, his eyes locked on mine. And I managed to reach over and take my car out of park. But I'm still just kind of almost in a daze staring at this thing. And then he opened that mouth, which I kept staring at thinking, okay, there's something in the mouth that can't be the mouth, that can't be the mouth. But no, that was the mouth. He slowly started to open that mouth and I finally unfroze. And that's when I just slammed my foot onto the gas. And of course, my car starts to fishtail. I have this horrific moment where all I can think of is it's going to be me alone in the ditch with the werewolf. My brain is screaming werewolf because oddly enough, living in the center of Michigan, where Dogman is oftentimes said to have originated, I had never heard of the Dogman. It seems like people in that area are very, very good at blowing things off. They're very good at going, oh, you know, that wasn't that. Oh, you're mistaken. So I had managed to make it, you know, 23 years without ever even hearing of the dog man. So I drove way too fast, the two miles or so to my home, which is not a comforting distance from dog man. I drove right up to my door. I scrambled over my passenger seat, went into my house, proceeded to go around and lock every door and window while my ex-husband is following me around. And all I'm saying is there's a werewolf and he's laughing and he's going, there's not a werewolf. What are you talking about? And I'm telling him, I'm going, no, there's a werewolf. And I'm trying to tell him what I had seen. And he's just not having any of it. He's telling me that a neighbor's Rottweiler had gotten out or I saw a deer from a strange angle. And I'm going, that's not possible. Like You don't understand. He's going, it was a big dog. And I'm going, he stood up on two legs. He kind of makes a sound and goes back to his video game. That night, I don't know that I slept a wink. I was hypervigilant. I remained hypervigilant for a lot of years. In all fairness, I had been fairly hypervigilant before. Like I said, I'd always been afraid. For a long time, I didn't tell really anyone else because I knew what I would get having grown up where I grew up. Several years after it happened, I can't even remember what we were talking about, but my grandmother brought up someone saying they had seen something. And I said, well, you know, I saw a werewolf once. And she goes, oh, you did not. You know, and I tell her the story. My grandmother, God rest her, was a wonderful woman, but she certainly wasn't hearing about werewolves. (laughs) So I don't think she believed the word I said. I kept it to myself for a very long time. I think the next time I actually even mentioned it to anyone was after I had met my current husband and had already moved out here to New York. And that was the first person I think that didn't laugh at me. He actually, you know, mentioned like, you know, have you looked for it? And I hadn't, you know, it just for some reason, it was one of those things that I had kept so buried that it just didn't even occur to me 
that I could search for this on Google. And this was several years ago. This was probably back in 2011, 2012. And I did some searching and I heard a lot of accounts, but I didn't hear anything that sounded kind of like what I had seen. A lot of people were like, oh, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't a dog, man. You know, you probably saw this or that or, but I know that whatever I saw was definitely of a canine type. The mouth obviously was horrific and something else, something else to look at anyways. But he was absolutely of like the canine persuasion. He had a muzzle. He had the ears that stood up, the ears articulated. I tried to convince myself for a long time that it was a man in a suit. I couldn't quite get past the muscles moving under the skin, you know, and how the ears and the mouth and everything, you know, how everything was so. If this would have been a costume, this person had to have worked for a multi million dollar studio. If this was a costume, it was the best costume I have ever seen in my life. So yeah, I did some research, but like I said, I didn't really find anything that kind of matched up. And I kind of just went back to keeping it to myself for a while. I told my kids as they got older, because they loved to hear the story of the time mom saw the dog man. So (laughs) I kind of managed to repeat it. I think they felt safe being that, you know, they lived in New York and this happened several states away when they were, well, one of them was very little, two weren't born yet. And it wasn't until recently, one night when I was bored and just kind of flipping through the internet that I happened upon Reddit. And I know that sounds ridiculous. I mean, I'm 40 years old. I spend most of my time online and I had somehow never managed to make it to Reddit, but I hadn't. And they had a dogman forum. That is how I, I finally ended up writing my encounter down, expecting people to be like, oh, that's not a dog man. You know, you saw whatever it is they may have thought that I saw. But most people were like, no, they come in several different types, you know, and they and they were quite accepting. And, you know, it turns out that a lot of people had had a similar experience. And I felt kind of, I mean, there were some people obviously that were trying to tell me it was a skinwalker or I had seen an actual, you know, werewolf, people wanting to know if his chest was bald or no, his chest wasn't bald. Like he had short black fur all over. And even if his chest had been bold, I still can't see how that would make him anything but a dog man. And then I had been listening to your podcast for a while, and I finally got the courage to send you my story. And here we are. I was about 10 years old, and I liked to play in my room and stuff i had a pretty vivid imagination because we didn't have a television or anything i had a couple gi joe figures i'd play with and stuff but i was always a good kid my parents were were sort of hippies they'd always go off and party and and i like to stay home because otherwise i'd be sitting in the car all night until they were done so i'd just stay home and entertain myself which i wasn't afraid we we lived in a great community there's nobody going to come and break in or hurt any of us. And I went to bed on time because I'm always a good boy. But in the middle of the night, I don't know what time it was. I didn't have a clock or anything, but it had to be after midnight. I woke up with an intense feeling of dread and panic. Like, I'm in danger and I need to do something. And I just looked around the dark room. We didn't have any lights out there. We barely had a porch light. And it was dark that night. It was over cloudy and the moon wasn't bright. And we didn't have any curtains because we didn't have any neighbors. You didn't have to worry about anybody looking in your windows. Our nearest neighbor was a mile and a half away. But when I turned my head and looked, there it was staring in the window, watching me in the bed. My windows are about five and a half, six feet off the ground. And it was sort of sloping its neck down to look in at me. I didn't think there was anything I could do. I slowly covered my head with the blanket, hoping that it hadn't seen me look over at it. But I knew that it had. I knew that it saw me. Later that night, when mom and dad came home, half drunk, 
I ran out and told dad that there was a demon outside my window and I thought it had horns on its head. And he went and looked and laughed at me. And he said, son, there ain't nothing in the dark that won't get you in daylight. And he went to bed and passed out. But somehow that sort of did make me feel better because he never told me there was no monster. He just said, if it's going to get you, it's going to get you. And there's nothing we can do, me or you, either one. And that was the end of my first encounter. Everything went as normal. We were raising chickens in the yard, roosters that dad would sell to people down in Georgia for some extra income. And they were always disappearing. He would blame bobcats and raccoons, but we never saw any bobcats or raccoons. We just found feathers on the ground and blood. So I'm not real sure that there were varmints that were actually getting our chickens there. It might have been a dog ranch. I don't know. I can't say for certain. But about a year and a half later, we got a swimming hole on the creek down there on the property where there's a big 30-foot rock you can jump off into the pool. Only the locals know about it. And it's the only place where you can actually dive in that's deep enough. The rest of the Spring Creek is about waist deep or so. So it was pretty popular with the local farmers and stuff. We went there every summer weekend. It was like a tradition. It was really rugged and craggy with the rocks down there at the secret swimming hole. It's awesome. And it, just the air smells beautiful. It's a wonderful, lovely place. But the trail is you have to take like a game trail for a quarter of a mile to get up there and then go down the steep bank, which basically just has footholds and you have to hang on to roots and tree vines to just get down there safely. The whole trail slopes like 35, 40 degree angles and it's loose earth. So if you fall, you're going to fall 40 or 50 feet down into the rocks on the side of the creek and heck, that could kill you. So it was kind of treacherous to begin with, but that's maybe what makes it such a beautiful area because it's so secluded. We went down there and swam for a while. And dad and mom decided that them and their friends were going to go off and do some more partying. And I wanted to jump off the rock a couple more times and swim some more. I was having a great day. And they told me to come on, but I just goofed off. And then I realized everybody had left. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, they left me. I was thinking maybe they were trying to teach me a lesson about not being left behind. Stick with the group. Do your thing. Do what you're told. So I climbed the steep bank up to the small trail. I sighed and threw my towel over my shoulder to get head back to the parking area. And when I heard it, it was a, a low, low, deep growl with a huff at the end of it. And I thought, oh, okay. Dad's just trying to scare me to teach me a lesson because I shouldn't have been left behind. But then it happened again. And I turned around to laugh at him and be like, yeah, you got me, Dad. No, ha, ha. But he wasn't there. And in the bushes behind a tree up on the trail above me, I saw it. The only reason I saw it was because it was blacker than the shadows behind it. Kind of made it off put from the background. And I'm thinking, there's a demon in the bushes with horns. And it stood up. And its ears moved. And that's when I realized they were ears and not horns. And I got a good look at it. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's a flipping werewolf. Now, this thing was so big. It mean, like so tall. Its shoulders and neck were really broad, like it was wearing football gear or something. But the rest of the body was skinny and lean. I don't know how I unlocked my mind from the panic and terror that had just suddenly washed over me. But I've got my feet up from under me and I started running as hard as I could down the trail. I just dropped my towel and everything and just hauled it as hard as I could. When I was about halfway down the trail, I turned and looked back to see if it was chasing me. And 
I swear, Vic, I swear it was standing exactly the same distance away from me as it was the first time, about 15 to 20 feet. But it was in the middle of the trail this time. And I saw it had dog legs, but I I was terrified and I was not paying attention to its hands or feet or anything like that. It had a long snout, but it never opened its mouth. I never got to see its tongue or its teeth or anything like that. It was just simply casually watching me and waiting, which made it kind of even creepier because I didn't know what to expect from it. So I ran as hard as I could back to the parking area and mom and dad and the friends were sitting down there waiting for me. I screamed, there's a werewolf after me. And they all laughed real big. And one guy said, He's going to write books when he's older. He's got a heck of an imagination, but I know I didn't imagine that. It didn't chase me out of the woods, but it definitely followed me. I don't know how it moved so fast and so quiet. A few years later, I was 15, and me and my uncle were squirrel hunting. He's an avid outdoorsman. He loved hunting and fishing. That was his thing. and He was teaching me how to deer hunt. We went out pretty much as often as we could, even though my dad didn't approve of it because him and his brother didn't really get along. Sometimes that happens with siblings. But anyhow, I wanted to learn the skills of the huntsmanship, the outdoorsman stuff. The I don't know exactly what to call it, but you know what I'm saying. You want to you want to know how to be able to feed yourself if you're out there in the wilderness. He wanted me to go squirrel hunting with him one day. And I'd never been squirrel hunting. I mean, I've shot a couple deer and some rabbits and stuff like that. But I said, yeah, that sounds cool. We'll go this Saturday. And we went up there and up on the same mountain ridge, because it was covered in game. There's turkeys, squirrels, rabbits, deer, bears, whatever you want to look for. It's up there, pheasants. We didn't see anything that day. The woods were dead quiet. Like, we killed two squirrels on the way in, but when we got up there where we were at hunting, there was nothing. Like, everything was laying still. There wasn't no birds. There wasn't no squirrels. I couldn't tell anything was going on. And the weather was moving in with a storm, and it was getting dark and rainy looking. So we decided that we were going to haul off the mountain before it got too dark and wet for us in the evening. After we got down in the canopy, we're walking down this logging road that's been grown up for about 30, 40 years. And it's got saplings and little trees growing in it. So it's kind of just like a wide trail at this point. It's no longer been used for any woodcutting stuff. But that day's back when the area was cut out of the wilderness back in the old days. So when we got under the canopy of the trees, it got really darker because there were thunderclouds overhead and we could we couldn't really see a whole lot and he turned on his flashlight that he had brought with him because he didn't want to step on any copperheads or snakes which there are plenty of those around here too as soon as we rounded the corner on the edge of the hillside there his flashlight shined on it standing in the middle of the logging road looking at us here was a dog man I'm not sure if it was the same one or not, because I don't know how long they live. But this one had like a gray tint to the edges of its fur, like an aging dog gets around their eyebrows and stuff. But he would just simply stood there looking at us. And he freaked out, and he dropped the shotgun and the flashlight. And I'm standing there holding a 22 long rifle, and that'll barely kill a rabbit. It won't kill a man. There's no way in heck I'm going to shoot at this thing and make it mad at me. I'm thinking he's just got us killed because he's the one with the shotgun. That's what we need. The thing, he never broke eye contact. And it just watched us. It was probably five seconds, but it felt like an hour. And then took like two or three steps off the road, down off the bank, and it vanished. After a couple seconds, I wandered over there and looked off to see, make sure it wasn't hiding in the bush below the bank to jump out and grab us. When we tried to walk past, 
but there was nothing. There was no sound. It was totally silent and it was gone. I don't know where it went or how it could have got out of there. If I had moved that fast, I'd be making all kinds of ruckus in the bushes. I don't know. It really, really shook my uncle up. He was just standing there, turned white as a sheet. He's a redhead guy, and he drinks a lot of moonshine. So he usually had a beet red nose and stuff, but he didn't have any color in his face whatsoever. And he was just standing there mumbling, red eyes, red eyes, right after he illuminated it with his flashlight. So I knew I had to get my uncle off that mountain. This is the only thing I could do about this. And we got back to the truck and got out of there. And I wish we hadn't told my dad about it, but I was trying to tell everybody I could, you know, because it's a need to know information and you might need to know. My uncle never went back to the woods and he wouldn't go hunting or for anything unless he was within sight of his truck. And about a year after our encounter, he moved completely out and moved to the city. I don't know if that helped him any or not, but he doesn't like for me to talk about it. And he will definitely never speak of it to anybody about this day. I've tried to get him to tell the story with me sometimes when we were hanging out with some other people, but he won't, he won't speak of it. I think maybe what my dad told me about it, it'll get you in the daylight as soon as it'll get you in the dark and there's nothing you or me or anybody can do about it. It helped me deal with it better. And maybe he had never been told that. My dad definitely didn't believe it. And I only recently came across your channel after 20 years. And I didn't even know what a dog man was until then. I thought it was, I was being haunted by werewolves. Some people seem like they don't believe you, but you can never in interpret what another person has witnessed if you weren't there. That's how they see it. You know, that's just the way it happens. It, maybe if it wasn't actual facts, that's how he perceives it. That really sticks with you for the rest of your life. And I swear to God, I hope nobody ever has to look at one of those. It all looks fun on TV when you see stuff in movies that are scary. But when you're 15 or 20 feet away from it and you realize that you just stepped down three notches on the food chain, it changes your perspective on life. My first encounter happened when I was 14 years old, and it was late December is what I remember, and it was during winter break, and I decided I wanted to come out for the last couple of weeks of deer season, and I already had harvested two bucks, and I had three tags. I was able to get a third antlerless tag, so I wanted to, I wanted to get a chance to maybe put some more meat in my freezer and uh, help my grandfather because we do use a lot of venison. We'd rather use venison than, you know, going to the store and getting some beef. To me, it has better flavor, and it's all natural, and uh, I find it more ethical in a way. And yes, we were farmers once upon a time, but to me, harvesting something that has lived a fulfilled, free life, being able to do what it was meant to do, puts me more at ease than going to the store and buying a pound of, you know, your ground beef. Or And I do enjoy a good prime rib or a good New York strip steak. I don't discriminate when it comes to that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I prefer wild game over typical stuff you'd purchase at a grocery store. So I decided to go out that Saturday morning. I remember waking up at 4.30 and I I just felt really off when I woke up. I felt anxious, you know, and I was thinking to myself, do I want to go out or do it? should I just sleep in and I'll go out this evening and I'll go out tomorrow morning, you know, get some more rest. And, uh, five o'clock rolls around and I finally decide to, you know, I'm going to go out and I'll have a better chance. The more I'm out there, if I'm actually out there, I get up and uh, I get ready. I'm feeling anxious this whole time. Like I'm on the verge of, and I'm, I'm, I'm a high strung person, I will admit, but 
I haven't felt that kind of pressure. And I remember not feeling that kind of pressure or anxiety like that since I was probably eight years old. I wasn't much of a morning person then, and I kind of trained myself to be more of a morning person. And uh, I remember getting up, I get ready, and I go to walk out the door. And I, before I walk out the door, I check how the weather's going to be, what the wind's going to be, so that way I have an idea of how things may play out and uh, where I should start the day off with of where I should sit, what spot should I choose, what would be the best spot. And our property's fairly large. It's half mile deep by a quarter mile wide. So that's fairly decent sized property. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to get to the spot I want on foot. So I step out the door and I remember it just being ice cold out. It was, I think, 23 degrees out that morning and it was frost on the ground. There was no snow, which was quite surprising for being late December, but there was no snow on the ground. The ground was very crunchy and hard and it was frozen from it being so cold. We end up having a really rainy November in early December instead of snow, I remember. And so I set off. I go walk behind our barn. I notice it's dead quiet. There's no noise, no wind. And it was, uh, I remember it being a crescent moon, so I had a fairly well-lit path. I didn't have to use a flashlight, so I, I didn't go out with a flashlight. And a lot of the time before this last encounter, and I'll probably get back over it, and go back to not using a flashlight again. But I like to not use a flashlight, so it alerts less in my area. And, you know, sometimes you walk past bedded deer and don't know it. Minimal disturbance is pretty much what I'm trying to get at. So I like to create the minimum amount of disturbance in the area. So that way I have the best hunt possible. And I walk up behind the bar noticing that it's quiet. I got a fairly amount of light, even though it's dark out. And I get about 150 yards away from our barn, from the back of the barn, and it drops down into this little swamp. And I have to cross this little bridge to cross a creek. We have rolling hills in our area, so it's not perfectly flat, but it's also abundance of woods and ag fields. So we have nice openings and nice choke points and this spot happens to be a big choke point and I have some game cameras set up there. And I remember walking down through there and I remember I pulled them all the evening before I went out, pulled all my cameras so I could check the batteries and check all the cards. So I didn't have any cameras out at this time. And once I get to that bridge, I remember getting this sensation of dread. Like there's danger if I keep going back here. If I keep going, there's danger. So I get up, step up onto the bridge, and I start having like a cold sweat, you know, getting nervous, getting anxious. And I'm looking around. At this point, I have my, my firearm in my hands, which was a 20 gauge HR. So, what it is, is it's a rifled shotgun designed to shoot slugs and slugs only. I'm holding it in both my hands at this point because I felt anxious and nervous. So I wanted to, you know, it was that sense of security. I had it right there in my arms, ready to go, ready for action. And I look around, I pause, I listen, and it's still dead quiet. All I can hear is my breath and my footsteps. And I decide to continue on. I'm going to go to the very back of this property. I'm going to see all these kinds of deer you know i'm just thinking about how my hunt's gonna play out and how it's gonna go so i continue on and i just felt like i was being watched at that point something was watching me and for a second i thought i heard footsteps behind me and i paused i take a few steps i pause listen take a few steps pause and listen and i'm trying to i'm wearing a soft bottom hunting boot it's a soft sole so that way it's more forgiving on uh noisy terrain and i get out to the first opening after coming up out of that low land and that crossing that bridge and i stop and i take a look and i'm just listening 
trying to see as far as the best I can, even though it's minimum moonlight, it's crescent moon. I take a pauser, gather my surroundings, and then I continue on. And I get to my blind. We lock our blinds because we have a lot of people, uh, land surrounding our land. And we've had people come onto our land unknowingly before. So we lock our blinds and I remember I'm sitting at the bottom of the steps and I'm looking for the key. So that way I'm not doing it up there on the frozen steps, just in case something happens. And I throw my slug gun over my shoulder and I slowly walk up the steps, have the key in my hand. I go to put it in the lock. I thing you know, I hear coyotes going nuts, just going absolutely crazy. And it sounds like it's only probably about 150 to 200 yards away. I I'm sitting over this ag field with a, hill in the middle of it and right on the other side of it is woods it's about 100 acres of woods just all woods so i'm thinking well maybe i'll see a coyote and this will become a coyote hunt put the key in twist it they're going nuts and i'm thinking wow that's insane they're right, like right there maybe i'm gonna see one and i step in the blind close the door lay my gun in the corner the closest corner to me and we have a nice chair in there and i sit down and i open the window and i'm still hearing them go off for a second and then i hear a really deep sounding howl almost like a wolf but it turns into kind of a scream at the end and it goes on for about a few seconds and then it stops and it's dead silent from there on and it sounded almost right on top of those coyotes maybe not a little bit further back in so I'm thinking, whoa, what was that? Maybe that was the big coyote. Maybe that was, and it'd be very, very rare to see a wolf in the lower eastern part of Michigan, in mid-Michigan. Usually you see something like that way up, maybe towards Alpena, Sheboygan area, or most likely up in the upper peninsula. But that would be very, very rare to see something like that down here. and. I thought that was quite strange. So I sit there and listen at this point, I could see just a little bit of light poking from the tree, coming from the skyline, but it's overcast, but you can start seeing it start getting light up. I think it was around five fifty ish. This is when I'm fully settled in this blind. It's starting to get six and I just see a tad bit of light. So I get these big binoculars out. And what I learned from a young age is that it kind of works like, it's like an extension to your pupil. You know how your pupils dilate at nighttime to allow more light in for you to see better. Well, having a large set of binoculars allows more light in one end for you to be able to almost see pretty well in low light conditions. And I've also learned that to be true with rifle scopes too. Therefore, I use fairly large high powered scopes on well, what's legal to use around here in order for me to coyote hunt makes it better experience and the special spotlight I use for them also makes it easier to see them through a scope. It's a tinted light. So it's like a amberish red color right around then when it's starting to get light, I like to take about a 15 minute nap or so a 20 minute nap just to kind of refresh myself for a second because it's not legal shooting hours. It's hardly bright enough to shoot yet. So it starts getting lighter, so my targets are more identifiable. And that way, Lord forbid, make either inhumane or misidentify my target for something I don't want to shoot. So I'm out sitting, and uh, I, I couldn't even get relaxed enough to be able to nod off. I was just too anxious. I felt really nervous the whole time. My heart was kind of pounding my chest a little bit here and there kind of my blood was running a little bit cold you know i was just real nervous and disturbed for it and felt like i was being watched it goes on like that for another hour or so and uh, it's starting to get light and usually i see deer as it's just starting to get light all the way up until broad daylight they'll stick around for a minute you know eat off our food plots eat off the ag fields and they'll hang out for about 30 minutes to an hour or so and then move on continue to where they're their destination is or wherever they plan on going and uh, then the next few come through and they just kind of keep filtering through until 11 o'clock 
usually or sometimes you'll get lucky and see that big buck midday but it's around seven ish and it's well bright enough to see to make a clear shot it's it's a little hazy out in the distance it's overcast so it's a little dark still and i remember i'm looking out the window that's facing north over this ag field and i catch something i'm looking through the binoculars looking at the very back of the fields about 250 yards away with these big binoculars and i set them down for a second to let my eyes adjust and so i'm not straining my eyes and i go to put it back up and i catch something out of the corner of my eye so i put them back down and look and here i see this what i thought for a second was a fairly large wolf or coyote but then i look at i'm, I'm sitting there looking at it i'm like wait no way that it's a coyote because it, it's it's all black it's like all black and all i see and i put my binoculars back up to get a better look at it all i see is bright yellow well not bright yellow eyes but that they kind of remind me of a black cat's eyes but they don't have the, the same pupil as them they have dog eyes and it's sitting there at the very edge Oh, I'd say it's probably about 150 yards away of the edge, other edge of this field to my right. And I'm sitting there staring at it. And it's sitting there looking over the field. Gets up for a second, you know, sniffs the ground. I'm thinking, what is this thing? No way this is somebody's dog. It was way too big to be somebody's dog. It kind of had a little bit of a hunchback, too. Like, it's when it got up and walked a little bit, that its back legs were a tad stubbier, tad shorter than its front legs so i thought what kind of dog is this and it, it had uh, a tail on it you know it looked like a wolf's tail to me it had the same shape same consistency and fur looking through the scope and at this point it being overcast uh, i get a little break in the clouds and sun starting to come through so i get a, a little bit of a sunspot through the field for you know every few seconds and I remember the rest of the day after that being completely overcast, but you know, I get a nice break for probably about 20 minutes of sunlight and I'm, I'm sitting there staring at this thing for a good five minutes, trying to, to figure out whether or not I should either, is it a coyote and I should shoot it? You know, I don't want to shoot somebody's dog by mistake. And is this a wolf? And if I mistake it for a coyote and shoot it, am I going to get in trouble? So a lot of thoughts are going through my mind right now. So I, I guess I come to conclusion. I look, I'm looking at it and I'm like, this thing looks too wild. It looks more like a wild animal than somebody's pet. So I decide I'm going to shoot this thing, get rid of it. So I, I didn't have a great enough angle out of that north window. So I go to the east window, which is the window facing it. And I slide it open as quiet as possible, just inch it open. And I get my gun up, I turn it up to five power, and I put it right on its right on its shoulder. And I take a deep breath. I, I'll let it out slowly. I slowly cock the back, hammer back. And it's it's an H and R, so it, ha it has no safety. It's just a basic single shot brake barrel slug gun, and it has a hammer on it that you got to manually cock. So I pull back the hammer, and the second it goes click, this thing, I'm looking at it through the scope right in its chest, turns its head right towards me, and is staring what seemed to me like right into my eyes from 150 yards away. And I'm looking at it through a high-powered scope, and I notice this, so I'm looking at it through the scope now at its face, and it has its ears cocked towards me. They look like you know, wolf ears. It looked like a, like I said, an overly large, like a large, large, bigger than, because I've seen wolf, wolves before. I've been up to the UP. I've had, I have family member that own like 80 acres up in the UP. And I remember being out there when I was, when, um, I think was it my third year after I started hunting, my third year hunting, we went up there for deer and I remember having a small pack of coyotes about three of them run three or four of them run right by her blind about 100 yards just 
walking through, and this looks way bigger than those wolves I've seen. And I, I notice it's it's staring at me. I'm staring at it. And next thing you know, it opens its mouth and it has really big teeth, like bigger teeth than I think the biggest dog I've ever seen in person was an Alaskan Malamute, or I think it was an Irish Wolfhound. And I thought their teeth were big. I thought they were big dogs. No, this thing was big, had big teeth, and it was almost like it was smiling at me. Didn't have its lip curled back. Um, I'm starting to freak out at the panic at this point. I'm like, should I shoot it now? Should I shoot it now? And I finally call myself. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to shoot it right between the eyes. And as I do that, it stands up and leaps from its spot forward. And I think it leaps like it, it leaps quite a lar- long way. I wouldn't say 50 feet, but it leaped probably a good 40 feet or so. Or less, you know, maybe I, I'm overthinking this and over-exaggerating a little bit, but it, it I've never seen a dog stand up on its back legs and leap like that ever in my life. You know, I've seen wolves and stuff and coyotes stand up on their hind legs to get a better look at their surroundings, but they usually, they run up, stand up on their hind legs. Even foxes do it. Get a good look at their surroundings, figure out or look for prey, and they back down on all fours and scurrying away. No. It leaped from exactly where it was standing, a good 30 to 40 feet, and then it leaped again, and then it leaped again until it was out in front of my north-facing window, and then it completely clears the other half of the field in two leaps, and mind you, that's 100 yards across from from the middle of where it was to this other tree line, and it leaps all the way across. And all I hear it was hitting the branches, and that was it. And my blood ran completely cold. My heart was like in my throat. Like I could, all I could hear was my heart pounding. And I just remember shaking, like buck fever times ten, like just shaking and being ice cold and sweating, like like a like it was like a. A faucet, like somebody turned on a faucet, like I was just sitting there pouring sweat and I didn't even have the heater on yet. I wasn't cold and I was still wearing all my hunting gear and I wasn't even cold enough yet to put the heater on. And I have uh, a hoodie, like uh, I had three layers on, but the first two layers were thin. So I had uh, my long johns on, shirt and pants. And then I had jeans over that and a t-shirt. And then I had um, this big Carhartt hoodie, this big dark green Carhartt hoodie. And then I had my camouflage jacket over that because I wanted I wanted a hoodie so I can put up over my head if I decide to sit in the blind, you know, be prepared for the weather and keep keep the cold off the back of my neck and keep my ears warm. And I'm just sitting there sh- drenched in sweat scared as i've more than i've ever been in my life and i closed all the windows and i put the gun across my lap and i just sat there i sat there i sat there until 12 o'clock noon and it, like I was, I was freaked out. I sat there until 12 o'clock noon and a lot of people, yeah, they sit out there. My grandfather didn't come out with me. So I'll usually set out until 10 30, 11 ish because that's when he makes breakfast. I sat out there till 12 o'clock noon. And then even when I went to go leave, I was so scared. I'm like, Hey, can you come out here? I, I called my grandfather up. Hey, can you come out here and pick me up? Because I was terrified. And I wanted to get out there and I just made some, some excuse as to why to have him come get me. And I don't remember what, what I told him. Um, I just remember being uh, how scared I was. And when he seen me, he's like, Oh, what happened? You look as pale as a ghost. Did something scary. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just not feeling well, you know? 
and told him I, I lied to him and told him I had a little cold or something. And I just remember after getting back to the house, I put my gun away, wiped everything off. I went straight into the bathroom and I sat in there because I, I felt sick. I was sick for a good 30 minutes. The, how up, uh, how unsettling this was to me at the time. And, you know, now that I've gotten older, I've learned to control that a little bit and call myself a lot more. But it was very traumatic to me at that time because I didn't really think I would ever in my lifetime see something like this unless I went out of the state for whatever reason or went all the way up to the UP or went up, went up into an area where there's been sightings. And even then, I was doubting I'd be able to see them. It probably, to me, it was like, oh, it's the right circumstances. Well, to me, I was thinking, wow, I guess we do have the right circumstances in order to, for something like this to occur. And for, uh, I think, what was it, the last two weeks of deer season, I didn't go out for a lo- the rest of that week. I ended up going out the last three days, but that's only because my grandfather was out here and he was only sitting about 200 yards behind me. And even then I still felt unsafe having another person out here with me. And it was really unsettling. And then uh, I think a a few months later, I ended up finding out about Vic's dog man channel. And I contacted him after hearing a few stories and I related to him. And I remember feeling being able to calm myself down and feel a little bit better about it. And a few years go on, I completely forget about it. And like I said, I'm in my early 20s now, and I'm having my own house redone. And my girlfriend and I are unable to be there at the moment because we have the floors ripped up and everything's tore up. So we're staying at my grandfather's. We've been here for, I think, three, almost a month now. And so I've, I found myself having more and more time to c- go out after work. I get off work at like six, six thirty, and I come home, get a shower and I'd be like, Oh, well, it's still daylight out and it's just evening time. I, I, I think I'll, I'll go out coyote hunting. And I don't usually don't, I've never had calls really work for me. Any form of call that usually every time I've used a call, even after hearing them, it just ended up being a completely silent night. And I don't know if that's coincidental or not with the dog man sighting or have anything to do with that, but who knows? But, you know, it's, it's years later now. And, uh, I think what was it three weeks ago now it was still, I think the weather was still in the seventies, 60 ish area, but I, I've been coyote hunting all summer at this point and going out every every other weekend or every Saturday that I can and just keeping it at that. But lately I've been finding like after having to stay with him for a little bit, I've had more time to go out. So I decided within the second week of, or yeah, no, it's been three weeks. So within the, so it's been four weeks we've been here within the second week of being here. So we've been here for a month now, almost a little over. And I decided I I have the time, so why not go out and look for more coyotes? You know, every chance I get, deer season's coming upon us. It's uh, only a few weeks away, and I decided I wanted to go out and get rid of some predators, you know. So I go out to the back. I use a climbing tree stand, and I have some fairly straight trees around here, but, you know, I, I have to clean off some branches, get rid of some branches, so that way I can get up a little bit higher. But the highest I can go is 10 feet before I'm enclosed by the tree line and I'm not able to see further than 50 yards in front of me because there's so much trees and limbs and whatnot that with all the foliage and stuff, even if the leaves weren't on the trees, I still wouldn't have a clean enough shot. So I set 10 and a half to 11 feet off the ground with a climbing stand not all ladder stand and uh it works pretty well i've had coyotes walk right under it. i've had deer walk right under it multiple times during muzzleloader season during archery season and i've made quite a few kills only 15 yards from sitting in a climbing tree stand 
So I go out back and I pick out the spot over this low area of a field. Now it's kind of part swamp and then the rest is agricultural field. And I think at the time they had only soybean stubble. So the ground was fairly bare, especially down in this low area. So I decided there was a nice open enough area. It's actually like a little corridor for coyotes. They, they walk across the south end of this field. And then they come up this lane along this hay field along the edge of the woods. And then they cut straight across the about 400 yards across this open regular field that they till up and plant corn, wheat, soybean or whatever. And they typically walk straight down the middle of it up over this hump of a hill. And most of the time, once they get halfway through, they turn west and start walking towards the corner of my property and the corner of that field. Mind you, I have permission to shoot over onto that field because that is also the neighbor that gave me permission. So I'll usually get them right at that creek that's right at the back of this field. And so we have a a lane that goes across the very back of our property and goes straight through the center of our neighbor's property that has the big steel telephone poles for, I think, Edison. We call that the Edison easement. That goes along the back of this field, the north end of this field, so does a crick. They'll usually stop for a few seconds on the edge of this crick, look around, look across it, get up over the other side, and there's still enough open space for me to make a clear shot on the other side, and they'll stop, look around, and then continue on their way. So I'll either usually wait for them to stop naturally, or if I have one of my higher-powered rifles, like a 450 Bushmaster, and a lot of people may think, well, why would you use something like that? Why won't you just use a shotgun or a 22 or a 223 now that it's legal? Well, every time I've used, and you, people can call me a bad shot all they want. I don't know if it's just my luck, but even when it comes to archery hunting, even if I make the best, the best shot, for some reason, I've lost animals. I've, and it's only happened twice. Once with a coyote, I shot with a, two, two, three, right on the shoulder. And it managed, I tracked it all the way through my neighbor's property and it was fresh, bright colored blood and it didn't stink. So I was very confused. So from now on, I use a 450 Bushmaster or my 20 gauge slug gun and I put it right on the shoulder and it stops them dead in their tracks. And the story does it with deer. So I decided to use that and it's what's legal and it's what works perfect so this next encounter we've been staying here for a while and uh i remember wanting to go out for coyotes so mind you it's it's still fairly warm out i think it was it was only four weeks ago and it was still 70 60 degrees out and uh i get up at 5 30 and I get ready and uh, it's 20 minutes till six o'clock when I decided to walk out the door and I noticed I didn't hear a single sound. The sun's starting to peek over the trees a little bit. So that was a little bit of an incentive to kick it into gear and try to get out here faster. But I noticed on my way out, I didn't hear a single sound, not a bird, not a chirp, nothing not even bugs or anything. And I start getting this uneasy feeling again. I'm like, this feels familiar, but I'm not thinking about my very first encounter with dogmen. That had completely passed over me and I wasn't even thinking about it. And I'm like, this feels really odd. This is really strange. So I take the same path I did all the way out to this back corner where out in this back corner, I'd pick the tree, hung my climbing stand up in it. And it's about 200 yards from the spot I was sitting from my first encounter. And I'm overlooking this lowland on the back of an ag field. It has an easement for Edison going through it from east to west on the north end of this field. And I'm sitting 50 yards under this lane, but I'm overlooking the lane from where I'm sitting in this tree. And there's a creek right at the back of that field and i like to sit down in this spot during the winter and uh 
this year they didn't plant anything down in this low area. It was too wet, so we got short grass down in there right now. But they decided to plant corn, so I decided to set up over this spot because the coyote use it as like a little corridor, and they stop right before they cross the creek, or either I stop them before they even get to the creek because I have a nice open shot in this low spot. It's about 200 yards deep and uh, 150 wide. And I have a nice open shot. It's probably 120 yards at the most where everything comes through and filters in and then crosses this creek and then up into our neighbor's woods. And the coyotes usually stop before the creek. Well, this lane that comes on the north side of this creek that comes down, it starts off in a very steep hill and then it comes down into this low area. Well, I caught something when I walked out here after it being completely silent. I felt uneasy when I was climbing the tree and I just felt really nervous the whole time. I'm like, why, why is I felt like this before out here? Why it was just very familiar and I became very nervous and and I'm sitting out, I, I'm been sitting at this point, I've been sitting in the tree for about 30 minutes and it's been dead silent. It's starting to get light enough for me to shoot. And I haven't seen a single thing. I haven't seen a deer. I haven't seen a sandhill crane. I haven't heard the little birds chirping, squirrel, rabbits. I haven't even seen a thing. And I catch a little commotion off the top of this hill. right next to this one, this first power pole before it enters onto my neighbor's property. I can see about 600 yards up to this hill and almost to his property line. But I see a little commotion up into the brown, up in the brown, t- little, the grass is a little bit tall up there. You know, people can't really get up there to trim or, or anything. So I catch a little movement. Now I have this rest that flips down. It, it, ratchet straps to the tree it's a flip up rest some people may know what i'm talking about but i have this rest i get my gun i had my gun between my legs i usually hang it up on a hook but i had it between my legs leaned up against this rest because and i use this rest because the crossbar on my tree stand isn't high enough for me to use as a rest. I like, I like to take the most stable shot possible. So I dispatch animals as humanely as possible, but I get my gun up on the rest. I don't have my binoculars. So I, I use my scope. I have the bolt open just in case, you know, I don't want to misidentify this as a deer, a person, somebody's pet. You know, I want to make sure it's what I'm after. And I, I think it's a two and a half by nine weaver scope is on this gun. And I have a range dial on the left side for focus so I can focus up to so far. So mind you, they're probably what 300 yards from where I'm sitting at this point coming down this lane. I noticed movement. I look through the scope, focus my scope in on it, go up to the highest magnification. And I noticed looks like two coyotes coming down and like exact like exactly like coyotes it looked like two coyotes but to me they were off they were fairly big and i've seen coyotes come down this trail many a times and i've sat out here like i said all summer pretty much at this point so i've had them come from all over and I, a lot of people ask, well, I don't, I hunt them at night or hunt them in the evening. I've had the best luck hunting them for my area in the morning. And over this spot specifically, it's just, they cross through my property. They cross through the neighbor's property in this spot. So this is where I chose to sit. I've seen multiple coyotes come down this trail many a times before. I see these two particular ones. Now, they look like normal coyotes that are just uh, in summer coat and, uh, you know, brownish tan or blonde almost with a hint of gray because it's starting to it's starting everything's starting to cool off. And it's, you know, it's getting to be that time of year and uh, they're coming down the trail. And I noticed they were bigger than usual. 
And coyotes aren't typically very big. I think the biggest coyote I've ever shot, and I weighed it with guts in because I used to skin them. But now I give them to, you know, friends that want to hide because, you know, I let them do it the way they want to do it. So I don't mess it up. I'm not particularly good at skinning small game. (laughs) I'm better with large like deer and bigger stuff. And I usually just give them away. But to me, they were off. But the biggest coyote I've ever seen was 75 pounds. That's big for a coyote. So a lot of people may think, oh, that... Are you sure? Are you over exaggerating? Yes, I understand. That's fairly big for a coyote. Back on track. I see these two fairly large coyotes coming down the trail. I'm like, oh, there's two of them. So, mind you, I forgot one thing to mention is I didn't just carry out one gun that morning. I carried out two firearms. I carried out an AR and I carried out my Mossberg Patriot. Both my AR and my Mossberg happened to be chambered in 450. And, you know, people may think I'm crazy. Yeah, I like it. I like that round a lot. It works fairly well for me. But I have this custom made 450 hanging off my back. I climb up into the stand with it on my back. I pull the other one up by rope. I have this AR hanging off the stand, tucked right next to my right leg. So the muzzle's only an inch from the bottom platform. I get my Patriot up on the rest. I'm noticing they're fairly large. They're coming down the trail. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to let them get to 120 yards. I'm going to stop them, and I'm going to try to dummy one of them. And hopefully, if I'm lucky, the other one doesn't jump into the woods and take off. And this one will either keep running towards me or run south into this field, and I'll get a shot off at that one. So I'm trying to decide which one I'm going to shoot. I have markers that tell me, and uh, basically just landscape or trees or bushes or tufts of grass that tell me that I have previously lasered with my rangefinder, and I use them as markers to determine my ranges and how far they are. So at this point, they're 150 out, so I'm just waiting for them to get up to this pine tree that's on the edge of this trail. And that's, that's 120 for me. That's 120. They're coming west, right towards me all I need them to do is get right before that tree and I'll stop them and they'll probably stop a little bit after that and I'll dummy one of them at least. So they're coming. I make sure there's a round in the gun. They get to that spot. I, I yelp at them. Give them a, you know, a little hoot. They both stop. Look my direction. I click my safety off. And as I did that, I felt as if I felt a little, you know, a little, I felt something on the side of my uh, outer side of my leg, like on my ankle, because I was wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes. Mind you, it's 60 degrees out this morning, like in, in the morning at that time or 70 degrees. So I was just in a camouflage t-shirt, blue jeans, and some comfortable tennis shoes. And I had soaked myself with the scent killer. So that way I don't, you know, leave my scent as I'm walking through. And I felt a little bit of a, a puff go up my up my pant leg on my ankle. And I hear a sniff noise. And I have my I'm looking out at these two coyotes and then I freak out for a second and I'm like, what's that? And I start looking over my shoulder down to the right of me and I have to look over this rest because it's like shoulder height for me. And I'm look, peeking over this rest and all I can see is the top of a head, two ears, and they look like coyote ears to me. And I can see it's, I can see it's back and it looks like coyote fur. I'm sitting there looking at it and my blood runs cold for a second because I'm thinking, what what is that? I didn't, I didn't get a good enough look at it right at that second to know what it was immediately. And then it clicks. Those are dog ears. What the, 
I set my forfeit, my, my Patriot down. I grab my AR and sight on safety off. And I point it straight down. And as I'm doing this, this thing is slowly getting down after sniffing my leg, both arms up on the tree. And now I don't remember getting a good enough look at its hands or paws or whatever. I kind of did for a second. To me, it looked like paws, but with really long fingers and nails. And I remember it, it wasn't super bulky or overly muscular, but it was big. It had, it was well built. And I'm looking down at it through my red dot and I I'm pointing it right at it and I'm sitting there and it's staring at me and I'm staring at it. And it looks exactly the same as these two odd looking coyotes out in this field. And I'm thinking, holy crap, this thing is huge. And it has yellow looking eyes, but the confusing part to me is they're not black. Neither of the three, what I thought was coyotes were now that I know that they're, or if they are dogmen or some variant of dogmen, they were not black like dogmen. They look like coyotes, very, very large coyotes. I'm 10 foot up in the tree and it's able to reach up and sniff the bottom of my pant leg and my foot. Uh, 10 foot from the platform to the ground. Okay, so I'm aiming at this thing. And it's standing there looking up at me. And I notice it has, you know, the yellow colored eyes, the amberish colored eyes, like cat eyes, the, the cat, like a black cat colored eyes. And it looked like a giant coyote, like from nose to tail. And after a second, you know, I, my, my heart's pounding at this point because I'm thinking, what is this thing? This thing is huge and it's staring at me over the right, my right shoulder. And I'm already turned around and I'm basically kind of facing the tree a little bit, pointing the gun straight down at it. And it starts curling its lip back and growling. And it had a re- it was growling and snarling like a coyote growls and snarls. If anyone's ever heard that before, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about and how vocal they get and how nasty they can sound. But it was way deeper and way louder than any coyote I've ever heard. And it, I could feel the sound in my chest. It was so loud. And and so deep. And as it, like, right after it starts doing that, starts circling my tree, probably only five feet away from the tree or so, maybe four, clockwise. Mind you, my, my, so my tree stands facing east. It was off my right shoulder, that's south. I'm standing up, I'm facing it. I'm pretty much facing the tree at this point, but aiming at that. And it starts circling my tree clockwise. And I'm making sure I have the sight on it the whole time. Like I'm literally doing tiny steps in a circle on this tiny platform way up in a tree. Pointing a somewhat cannon of a rifle at it. And it goes around once and it gets so look if i was looking directly at the tree that's facing west it gets past the tree and i i remember pulling the rifle in to my chest pointing it straight back down towards the ground right at this thing right at its head off off the other side of the tree so that's like northwest 
facing northwest at this point. And I'm thinking, I've had enough of this. This needs to stop. I put, and I'm thinking for a second, like it, as I, as this was happening, I was thinking, is this one of them dogmen? Should I shoot it? Would that be a bad idea? I'm thinking, well, maybe can I scare it off? Is this thing, if I shoot it, is this thing going to maim me or kill me? So I decide after it goes around, I'm done with this. Put one right right in front of its nose, right into the ground. And it kind of jumps a little bit back. Just not, 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 not like, like uh, probably like an inch or so, like, and is staring right at the ground, right where I had put this round and it dirt's falling down onto it and i notice it's pawing at its, its ears well i have a fairly large muzzle brake on the end of this custom built ar and it actually hurts my ear so much that i've actually went to clean my ear after shooting it with no hearing protection very bad idea wear your hearing protection always i've actually cleaned blood out of my ear after a day of shooting this rifle because it is so loud and deafening and it's pawing at its ears and it's staring down at this little crater I put into the ground and stuff's falling on it and it shakes itself off a little bit, slowly looks back up at me and as it does, it starts walking away. It looks away. It's about 50 yards to my, my north, so north of me. It stands up, and mind you, there's that creek that I'm sitting next to. It's The creek's 50-something yards away, and it jumps across. I hear it hit branches, and that was it. That's, that's all I could hear, and it was silent after that. And I finally come to my sense and I start looking around and I remember those two coyotes and I look back and I'm starting to look for them. And I notice they're still at that pine tree, 120 yards away. They're standing on their hind legs, staring at me, both of them. And I'm thinking, wow, there's three of them. And as I'm thinking that, I see them both turn. They look into the woods, look back at me, look back into the woods, and jump and gone. And that's since that day. And I forced myself to go out the next day, not not the next morning, not when it was dark out. I made myself come back out here. And I sat out here. I walked out here again. And I sat out here, and there was but there was birds chirping and I seen some turkeys and, and I remember I'm like, okay, well, that was weird. And, uh, I, I remember still feeling a little bit uneasy and nervous and, uh, you know, fairly hesitant to even go climb back up into that tree stand, you know, to get a look at the land. Sometimes I'll check, I check on my things regu- on a regular basis. Like every two to three days, I'll come drive out back and check cameras or check stands make sure everything is clean you know taking care of stuff so my grandfather doesn't have to now i i I still feel a little nervous every once in a while and it's only been four or three weeks now since this has happened but even just getting halfway to the halfway point on the property to me is like at night is I find to be too stressful and it, 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 it it has kept me up at night at times. And, uh, my girlfriend is, she's very hot blooded. So she has to sleep with the window open and it's been cooler lately. And sometimes if we don't have the fan going in our window and it, since it's been a lot colder, I find myself laying up at night, listening and hoping that I don't hear any of these things again or even see it looking in my window which would be an ultimate terrifying experience but maybe then i'll be able to prove to my girlfriend that these things are real and 
And uh, I, I have tried to tell a handful of people about it. And uh, I've told my grandfather. And uh, he thought I was, you know, he, he just told me, oh, you're seeing things. You know, you're seeing things. Probably staying up too way too late. Not getting enough sleep and seeing things. And no, <laughs> no, that's not the case. And I've told my grandmother. And she took it as I was just telling her some story that somebody told me like, oh, so is this some story? And I'm like, yeah, what's, what's the point? And then I tried telling my girlfriend and she just, she's like, I don't think, I don't know what you saw, but I don't think there's anything really out there. And it, 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 sometimes it lately, it hasn't been so bad to keep me up at night. I haven't had any dreams about it, which I, I have had very bad dreams about it getting getting a hold of me and you know i'd wake up in, in a cold sweat at that point but you know as far as it being a fairly traumatic experience i really try not to let it ruin my day my life and the things that i enjoy and one of those things is being on this property and being out here and enjoying nature and in the way I like to enjoy nature. And I don't want that. I don't want that taken from me just because of some thing out here that, you know, it's gonna, you know, to me, it's like a wild animal, but you know, there's, it's almost like an ancient being that they know they, they think they're almost bipedal and almost, I wouldn't say humanoid like, you know, Bigfoot have are more humanoid like, but they kind of think the same way. Well, oh, if I mess with that, I'll get a good reaction out of that type situation. You know, it's almost like a game to them. And uh it can be unsettling, but you no, know, I've what I've learned is to take it as it it very much well could have easily ripped me out of that stand and tore me up or even jumped up up in that tree with me and shredded me easily like there's no doubt that this thing could have easily hurt me and even if i would have shot it what i highly doubt well i don't highly doubt it i don't doubt that it would wound it and make it fairly mad but to me that would probably i'm kind of 50 50 on if i'll probably just make it mad and have it shred me or you know or have it just walk away with a bullet hole in it and leave me alone but i'm more on the side of i'm all like i said i'm almost 50 50 but i'm more of on the side of that i'll probably make it mad if i poke the right buttons and to me that seems like one of those buttons and uh i hope people take my experience as you know try not try your hardest it's some people it affects different and i understand that some people are affected differently and some experiences may be more traumatic and uh i try to lit, basically i just take it as it comes like live each day as it comes type situation. And I try to block out any nerve or any nervousness I have about it. So that's my story.